American Horror Story's seventh season, Colt, definitely stands out as one of the most divisive seasons in the series' history, and with its promotion and plot hinging on one of the most divisive moments in American history, the 2016 election, it is no mystery why this is the case. But as the season progresses, the 2016 election becomes less and less important, and instead the season contextualizes itself with flashbacks to many real cults in American history. To me, the season is a mixed bag with an oftentimes frustratingly non-linear timeline, but what it does have going for it is its incredibly strong ideas. The season's protagonist, Ali Mayfair Richards, feels like a reverse-engineered Lana Winters, who is the prototypical protagonist in AHS, whose life gets turned upside down when a cult of clowns led by Kai Anderson utilize her many phobias to destroy her life. Throughout the season, Colt highlights these two characters' journeys, and oftentimes the season feels like a love letter to these two actors, Sarah Paulson and Evan Peters, who both push their performance limits in their respective roles in the season. So this video will be a true deep dive into all things AHS cult, starting with the season's conception to its promotion, and then after that I will be recapping the season as a whole with a ton of behind the scenes trivia and many more surprises along the way. So strap in for what is by far my longest upload to date that I've had a ton of fun putting together, and let's begin with the conception of AHS season 7. So all the way back in October of 2016, during the heat of the election cycle and the air of AHS Roanoke, FX greenlit AHS for a seventh installment. However, it was also around this time that Ryan Murphy would completely steal the spotlight from season 7 by already teasing a potentially game-changing eighth season. But Ryan Murphy would again steal the thunder from season 7 that same month when he announced for the first time that the Murder House Coven crossover would be happening sometime after season 7. But back to the season at hand, in January of 2017, Ryan Murphy began teasing that the season would have something to do with the recent election, and it was also announced around this time that both Sarah Paulson and Evan Peters would be returning for their seventh consecutive seasons. The season's main ensemble would later turn out to be those two, Billy Lord, Cheyenne Jackson, and Allison Pill. Billy Lord and Allison Pill were both newcomers to American Horror Story, while the other three were veterans at that point. Billy hopped over to AHS after her previous Ryan Murphy show, Scream Queens, got the axe, as is a somewhat common occurrence in the Ryan Murphy verse. When one show ends, just hop on to AHS. This season would mark Allison Pill's first and last collaboration with Murphy, but I must say I'd love to see her tackle a different role on AHS one day if she were ever open to returning. As for Cheyenne Jackson, Colt would be his third consecutive season after making his AHS debut as Will Drake in Hotel as well as playing everyone's least favorite reality TV producer, Sidney James. About a month before AHS Cult ended up airing, FX released these cast portraits, which I think are really cool, as for the most part, they feature the characters in their natural, moody habitat, but if you look closely, you'll find a creepy clown somewhere hidden in the background. These posters also reveal the character names for these actors. So there's Sarah Paulson as Ali Mayfair Richards, Evan Peters as Kai Anderson, Billy Lord as Winter Anderson, Kai's sister, Cheyenne Jackson as Dr. Rudy Vincent, and Allison Pill as Ivy Mayfair Richards, Ali's wife. The reason I bring these up now is because more than just those five cast members who are billed as main received character posters, and to me, those other characters make up the season's true ensemble, so those other significant cast members are Adina Porter as Beverly Hope, Leslie Grossman as Meadow Wilton, Billy Eichner as Harrison Wilton, Colton Haynes as Detective Samuels, and Chaz Bono as Gary. Of them, only Adina Porter and Chaz Bono had previously appeared in AHS, but much like Billy Lord, while Colt was Leslie Grossman's first season, she has since appeared in every season that's followed. Billy Eichner returned once more in Apocalypse, however, both Colton Haynes and Chaz Bono have yet to return to AHS after Colt. 
But let's go back in time a little bit because I did skip ahead to show you those character portraits. AHS Colts promotional campaign actually kicked off back in July 2017 at San Diego Comic Con, where the first teasers for the season premiered, officially revealing the title for AHS Season 7, to be cult. Also at Comic-Con, just as a side note, there was this zoetrope attraction themed around AHS cult, which I just so happened to leave out of my AHS attractions video a couple weeks ago, so here's a little taste of what that experience was like for fans. The ensuing promotional campaign reiterated these clowns and cult-like voiceovers, but they also featured imagery of bees, holes, hexagons, and a handful of them teased the suburban setting and the season's patriotic elements. In addition to the character posters, Colt has a handful of really cool posters as well, which were shot by photographer Frank Ockenfels under the creative direction of Todd Hewins. But overall, these are some really underrated posters when it comes to the series, and I think they compete with some of the most iconic posters like Asylum, Coven, or Freak Show. As we got closer to the first episode airing on September 5th, FX began releasing promos that threw out the clowns from the previous marketing campaign in favor of the the actual clown masks that would end up being used on the show. Those masks, as you'll see, I will compliment profusely as this video goes on, and trust me, we will do a deep dive into each of them when the time comes. And then on August 23rd, 2017, the official trailer for the season was released. As usual for FX shows, the trailer first began playing at movie theaters before being posted online and airing on TV, which is always a fun part of AHS pre-seasons. Colts trailer previewed the pilot's jumping off point, the 2016 election, where Evan Peters' Kai Anderson is shown rejoicing, and Sarah Paulson's Ali Mayfair Richards is shown completely melting down. The trailer also gives us a peek at the clown cult, as well as the season's freak show tie-in, a comic book based on Twisty. And overall, the trailer sells the season as an intense psychological thriller, emphasizing Ali's phobias and the scenes of home invasion. And with that, fans were primed for the premiere of AHS Cult on September 5th, 2017, and they were definitely looking forward to seeing some of their favorite actors again, but I also remember there was also a sense of reluctance over the election scenes shown in the trailer, as well as the other bombshells dropped along the promotional campaign, like controversial guest stars, or the confirmation that Cult would be the first season of AHS to feature zero supernatural elements. So with all of that being said, let's jump right into to the first episode of AHS Cult. I will be recapping the episodes and taking you on many behind the scenes tangents with a couple special guests and hopefully this will all feel like a all-encompassing retrospective love letter to this season. Episode 1 is entitled Election Night and it was written by series co-creators Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk and it was directed by longtime AHS director Brad Becker. The season opens with a montage of real footage from the 2016 campaign cycle focused on both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, as well as a focus on depictions of violence at political rallies and depictions of police brutality and violence during various protests. The contrast between these politicians going back and forth at each other, all while ignoring the significant civil unrest that was bubbling up at the time, is perhaps speaking to a feeling of how both candidates, being arguably wealthy public figures, were completely out of touch when it came to to the issues that were affecting those who were financially middle or lower class. When it's focused on Trump, the montage includes his border wall as a staple of his campaign, as well as this infamous moment at a rally where he speaks on the loyalty of his base. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? When it's focused on Hillary, it focuses on her own condemnation of Trump, as well as one of the primary points of criticism against her at the time, which was her her emails. Does it do a great job at highlighting what the campaign was actually like? Absolutely not. It is barely a minute long, but what it does do is set the stage for something that we'll see Kai Anderson attempt in the episodes to come, which is to utilize this sort of civil unrest to seize his own political power. This is a goal that sort of remains consistent, but gets many asterisks added along to it along the way throughout the season, so let's just jump into it as after this montage, the premiere episode of Cult flashes forward to November 8th, 2000. 
2016 in the fictional town of Brookfield Heights, Michigan, where Kai Anderson himself first learns about Trump's victory in the election via Fox News, and talking to himself, he warns that the revolution has begun. Elsewhere in Brookfield Heights, married couple Ali and Ivy Mayfair Richards are still in denial as their news provider, MSNBC, is still reluctant to call the election in Donald Trump's favor. And as Ali says, I won't believe anything until I hear Rachel Maddow say it. She's the only one I trust. Only when news breaks of Hillary Clinton's concession call does reality set in for Ali, who then immediately breaks down. While Ivy consoles Ali, their nanny must console their son Oz, who now works worries that his mom's marriage may be at risk. Tom Chang, played by Tim Kang, is their neighbor and a local councilman, and at this election night party, he claims that 40,000 votes in Michigan alone went to Jill Stein, a Green Party candidate who ended up finishing in fourth place overall with 1% of the total vote, behind Trump and Clinton, of course, but in third place in the 2016 election was Gary Johnson, a libertarian candidate who ended up taking a bit over 3% of the vote. Once Tom drops that statistic, Ali seems clearly taken aback. Cutting back to the Anderson household, Kai puts together a last-minute election night costume in his own fit of hysteria. With a homemade Cheeto dust foundation and black eyeliner, Kai taunts his sister, Winter Anderson, who just so happened to campaign for Hillary Clinton in this now previous election cycle. Now that Trump's president, Winter worries that her right to an abortion may be at risk, which was right on the money as during Trump's presidency he ended up getting to nominate three Supreme Court justices, making way for a conservative-leaning court that ended up overturning Roe v. Wade 6-3, which made abortion an issue that fell back on each state's government, and now in 2024, where abortion is currently illegal in 13 states and is heavily restricted in other states as well. We are in an unresolved election year as I speak, so hopefully a bunch of states are about to put abortion on the ballot. Kai and Winter then intertwine their pinkies as Kai relishes in the fear of not only Winter, but of the entire country. This pinky thing is important, but I'll explain that later. We then get this season's title sequence, which is overwhelmingly green in color and features American iconography, clown and circus imagery, as well as Halloween masks of both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. We will circle back to this title sequence at the end of the season to fully analyze what hints and connections it possesses. But once we're back from the title sequence, episode 1 continues with an honestly great bit of fan service as every AHS fan's favorite killer clown, at least before this season aired, Twisty, is back from the dead and he's killing couples on picnic dates just like he did back in the 50s. Twisty looks just as terrifying as he did in Freak Show, as John Carroll Lynch returns to play him in this scene, as well as the one or two other appearances that Twisty has later on in the season. An element of this season that often goes understated is its slasher element, and it may not be the most consistent horror element throughout the season, which often opts for more psychological horror or cult horror, but episode 1 at least kicks off the season with a good old-fashioned slasher chase scene that is both scary and campy. But as it turns out, this was all just a scene in a comic book that Oz is reading. In the AHS universe, Twisty is now immortalized as a comic book character. I think this idea was really fun and I wish more seasons played with similar ideas that infamous characters from seasons past would one day be immortalized in the media of the AHS universe, much like how AHS itself often immortalizes infamous killers from America's past in both this season and its wider scope. And I think this twisty comic book is the most meta thing they've ever done, even if its intention wasn't to be as self-referential as I am interpreting it. Back to the show, Ali catches Oz reading the twisty comic book and it triggers her chlorophobia, a fear of clowns, which as you'll see is one of many phobias that Ali has. Oh, and by the way, we've experienced a time jump that's kind of super confusing and should have been marked by a title card right after the title sequence, 
because later on in this episode you'll see Ali reading some tweets and you'll see that the date is now March of 2017, a full four months after the opening scene. I definitely missed that time jump the first time I watched this season and it is a source for a lot of confusion if you do miss it. But this is crucial information as you'll see that the titular cult did a lot of work during those four months and what we are about to see unfold starting in March of 2017 is actually the beginnings of their larger plan and not as spontaneous as it may seem in this episode. At a city hall meeting, Kai Anderson gives a rambling speech about how the government must harness the fear of their constituents by essentially advocating for domestic terrorism so that the quote-unquote weak will be more dependent on their government and maybe easier to control. Listen, Kai's message is never super clear and it does shift a lot throughout the season, but in these early episodes his focus really seems to be inciting civil unrest in Brookfield Heights to boost his own political profile, and go from a guy who was blending Cheeto dust in his basement to an all-powerful politician. He is subsequently laughed at by the city council, and specifically councilman and friend of Ali and Ivy's, Tom Chang, thoroughly insults Kai. Kai warns Tom and the rest of the council that there is nothing more dangerous in this world than a humiliated man. Later, we see a therapy session between Ali and Dr. Rudy Vincent, or just simply Vincent as I'll be calling him for the rest of the video. Ali vents about how her housekeeper has gone missing and how the election results have caused all of her old phobias to resurface. Ali's most relevant fears in the season are definitely the fear of clowns and the fear of holes. Ali mentions during the session that something similar happened to her in the aftermath of September 11th, but her want to be stable enough to maintain a relationship with Ivy is what got her through that time in her life. Vincent then gives Ali a prescription for an anti-anxiety medication, which Ali reluctantly accepts while also saying how much she doesn't like how those meds make her feel. After therapy, Ali stops at the world-famous Fields Market, which has been featured in so many things, including this infamous Desperate Housewives episode. Two choppers, we're having a special today on not getting shot, but it's only available at the Back of the store! The Tanache video for Needs. And it even gets reused in AHS Double Feature. Go fuck yourself, motherfucker! The grocery store is famous enough to have its own Wikipedia page, which claims it's also been featured in things like Bird Box, The Office, Bones, Criminal Minds, Birds of Prey, Alvin and the Chipmunks, and Guy's Grocery Games. If one day they let buildings get EGOTs, uh, I'm throwing Fields Market in the, <laughs> in the ring. I don't know if that makes any sense. Anyway, while shopping, Ali is greeted by a MAGA-supporting cashier named Gary, played by Chaz Bono, before she's terrorized by masked clowns who do things like have intercourse in the produce section, chase Ali with a scooter, and blast loud rock music. Once Ali is able to escape to her car, she is horrified to find that one of the clowns is already in her back seat. This jump scare causes Ali to crash her car into a nearby pole. Ah. Oh my god, it's bad. I ruined the car. You did. You really did. So this whole sequence with the clowns was definitely the meme of this first episode with Ali throwing bottles of rosé at the penis-shaped clown on a scooter. The scene's absurdity definitely did not go over viewers' heads. Of course, as thousands of citizens now spoke from cities small and large... Seems slow to Yeah, tonight. hey, how are you? You went after my husband. If anyone should be afraid, it's you. Two choppers, we're having a special today on not getting shot. I think we can make it. Get the fuck out of here, fucker! Hey! Hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm sorry for putting a crimp in your day, but I'm pretty sure that my cheating husband is in here right now. <laughs> Thank you.
The choice for the season to feature a cult of clowns was certainly inspired by the clown craze of 2016, where Americans, Canadians, and Brits were all given a small dose of hysteria as a small yet concerning to those who fear clowns amount of sightings of evil appearing clowns in ominous settings began occurring. The sightings were propelled by social media, then news outlets picked up on it, and it became a whole news story during the last few months of 2016, around the same time of the 2016 election. So it's obvious why Ryan Murphy and Slash or the team connected the two events for this season. In the following scene, Ivy serves Sue Sylvester as she claims that the police were unable to find any clowns on the store's security tapes, just Allie screaming at nothing. But at least in this moment, Allie knows what she saw and recalls how each of the cult's masks seem to specifically trigger her individual fears. Ivy tells Allie that that she believes her. Later though, Allie and Ivy quarrel about how little Allie's been showing up for work at the couple's restaurant, which is called The Butchery on Main. In the ensuing argument, Ivy begins to shed some doubts on Allie's story about the clowns in the grocery store, and this switch up makes Allie apologize and promise Ivy that she will get her anxiety under control. But clearly Ivy is holding on to some resentment about something bigger than this grocery store incident. As it turns out, Allie was one of those 40,000 voters in Michigan who voted for Jill Stein, which Ivy begins to let out some frustration on Allie over until their argument is interrupted as none other than Kai Anderson douses them in coffee, claiming to have innocently tripped. This marks the first time that Allie has knowingly crossed paths with Kai. This chance encounter seems to have been meticulously orchestrated by him. Later, Winter Anderson responds to Ali and Ivy's ad for a nanny, and as Winter is interviewed by them, we are simultaneously formally introduced to Kai's Pinky to Pinky game, where once your pinkies are intertwined, you must tell the complete truth to your pinky partner. In this montage split between the pinky session and the nanny interview, Winter claims that her proudest moment was when Lena Dunham retweeted her proudest moment of my life was when Lena Dunham retweeted me. I got almost 6,000 followers from that. Just not enough to elect the first woman president. Which is certainly some chilling foreshadowing for some events to come. Winter also admits to Kai that he is what she fears the most, and the scene ends with her getting the job as Allie and Ivy's nanny. In the next scene, Kai officially sets his evil master plan into action as he racistly berates a group of Hispanic men and throws a condom full of piss at them. He promptly gets the shit beaten out of him, but alas, that also appears to be a part of his plan, as a mysterious third party is seen recording the altercation from the bushes. While babysitting Oz for the first time, she asks him if he's ever seen a real dead body. He hasn't, so Winter shows him some on the dark web. At a private dinner date at the butchery, Ali gets served a particularly holy dish that triggers her trypophobia, and she is also visited by another clown. Ivy scolds Ali for not taking her new medicine, and the gaslighting officially begins to convince Ali that she's genuinely having a break from reality, as the cult manages to switch out the holy dish for its normal counterpart just in time. Back at the house with Oz and Winter, Oz notices an ice cream truck across the street, and the group of clowns from the grocery store come piling out of it. Much later, Allie and Ivy then come home to find that their street has turned into a full-on crime scene as Councilman Tom Chang and his family were all found dead in their home. Oz tells his moms that the clowns did it, and we are then shown a flashback confirming that the clowns did in fact do it, as Winter took Oz over to watch the murders happen through a window. But when it's just the adults, Winter tells a completely different story, and Ivy blames Oz's version of events on his night terrors. The scene is also the soft launch of Detective Colton Haynes. His real character name is Detective Samuels, but how boring. The episode ends with Allie turning over in her bed to find the penis clown in in Ivy's spot. This first episode is not great in the wider context of the season, and I think it's responsible for a lot of the hate that I've seen the season get. The election night scenes with Sarah Paulson and Evan Peters both going balls to the wall with their performances 
over the 2016 election is just too over the top for a season that's actually much more grounded in both its performances and political commentary in every other episode besides this one. When this episode aired in 2017, the 2016 election was still fresh in our minds, so seeing this depiction of it immediately reads as parody and not relatable, and I don't think it helped sell viewers on the season. The same thing goes for how Kai is introduced to us by committing a hate crime. In this first episode, the writers really were just forcefully throwing messages at us in a way that was very visceral, yet insignificant when you look at the season's bigger picture. But as is the case with a lot of episodes written or co-written by Ryan Murphy, he threw a lot of strong concepts out there when it comes to the season's tone that thankfully the other writers stripped back into a more believable and grounded tone that we see in the rest of the season for the most part. And the tone in the rest of the season is able to convey stronger messages without them being as in your face and still, of course, delivering horror. Another issue I have with this episode is that the inclusion of Twisty in the bigger picture of the season is really nothing and he's only there for fan service. He never makes any more physical appearances after episode two, so I think that's about three or four minutes of screen time in the entire season. That serves absolutely no purpose to the plot. Episode two is called Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. It begins with Ali alerting Ivy about that clown in their bed, but after a somewhat thorough search, they find no clowns and Ivy continues to act annoyed with Ali and not believe her, which causes Ali to believe there is something seriously wrong with her brain. After Ivy believed Allie for one whole scene that was immediately walked back in the next scene, it's clear that a cycle is beginning to form, and this cycle makes up a majority of the events for the first four episodes. You know, Allie sees a clown, she tells Ivy about the clown, Ivy looks for the clown, there's no clown, Ivy scolds Allie for making things up, Allie feels insane. That's basically the cycle of the next couple of episodes. Meanwhile, Oz has a night terror featuring both Twisty and the penis clown, and after he wakes up, Ali tries to console him, but Oz pushes her away in favor of Ivy, and this appears to be a reaction to Ali's recent behavioral changes. Elsewhere, the local news has already branded Kai Anderson as an innocent victim after the events of the last episode, thanks in part to that cell phone footage of the altercation, which we now learn was taken by Meadow and Harrison Wilton, but more on them later. The local anchor woman Beverly Hope, played by Adina Porter, also reports that the quote-unquote attackers have already been detained by ICE. Then Kai himself holds an impromptu press conference where he reiterates some of Donald Trump's racist claims about immigrants before he announces his own campaign to run for the vacant city council seat left by the councilman that, spoiler alert, Kai himself killed the other night. The news, on the contrary, reports that the Chang family died as a result of a murder-suicide. Later, a racist chef at the butchery on Maine gets into a heated argument with Pedro, one of the cooks, which Ali breaks up in a way that doesn't exactly feel like she's on Pedro's side. Pedro, we will speak English only in my kitchen so we can all communicate. Chupamelo. Fuck you! You get that cholo shit out of my kitchen before I shove this ladle up your ass. Bring it, pendejo. Whoa, what the hell, you two? Get back to work, Pedro. Then, after gifting Oz a twisty action figure, Winter teaches him Kai's Pinky to Pinky game. Just as a side note on this twisty action figure, it was designed by Mike McCash, and this was an early version of it compared to the final version in the show. Mike McCash is a longtime makeup artist, and I'll talk a lot more about him later because he also designed the masks for the clown cult. But again, I talk about all that later, once I can talk more freely about the clown's identities and all of that. An indiscriminate amount of time later, Ali and Ivy come home to discover Winter has let Oz hang out across the street with the new neighbors, none other than Meadow and Harrison Wilton, who have very quickly moved in to the Chang family's old house. Harrison's like really into bees and he's a beekeeper, and he proceeds to explain to his new neighbors why he thinks a hive is just the perfect natural community. But this is the first and the last time these bees will be brought up, so it appears their inclusion in the season was solely to make this one obvious connection between the collective behavior of bees and the hive mind strategies that many cults attempt to recreate. Nice. Speaking of how the bees play no real role in the season, that's 
honestly kind of disappointing to me considering how much they were emphasized in the marketing campaign and how it could have been a really cool connection to Candyman, which shares a lot of similar themes with AHS cult. The Mayfair Richards' new neighbors aren't just into bees, though, as they are both the co-vice presidents of the Michigan chapter of the Nicole Kidman fan club. This revelation causes Harrison to come out of the closet as gay to his neighbors, and he explains that he and Meadow made a pact in high school that if they weren't married by the age of 35, they would marry each other. And here they are. Later on at the Mayfair Richards household, some wholesome family moments are interrupted when Ivy gets an alert that the security alarm at the restaurant Hallie offers to go despite, you know, that recent resurgence of all of her past anxieties and the constant visits from clowns, which for all she knows are either terrifying hallucinations or terrifyingly real. But you see, Oz has made his mom preference clear at this point, and he likes Ivy. And that's enough for everyone to be okay with Allie investigating a potential security threat all alone. Ivy, who clearly hates her wife, goes along with the idea without any protest, despite, you know, this clearly being a setup for another clown episode. On the contrary, Allie doesn't find any clowns at the restaurant. Instead, she finds that racist chef hanging out in the meat locker. And by that I mean... She's dead. A week later, Ivy invites Allie's therapist, Vincent, over, unbeknownst to Allie, and Ivy very casually dips out of the house so that the two can have an impromptu session. Allie expresses guilt over the death of the meat locker guy, because apparently he wasn't actually dead when she found him, but her attempt to save his life is actually what killed him. Vincent assures her that Allie didn't kill him, you know, she didn't put him on the hook, and the police know that. The mention of the police causes Allie to scoff as she recalls the encounter she had with Detective Colton Haynes from the night of the meat locker incident. The detective asks some pointed questions about Pedro, who had just had that argument with Mr. Racist the day of his eventual death. But anyways, after this brush with death, Ali tells Vincent that she feels vindicated, that her phobias were all justified, and she was correct to fear the outside world, which has only become more heated and violent since the election. Hard cut to the Wiltons offering a gun to the person who's potentially experiencing a mental breakdown, which which Allie accepts. Later, after fortifying her house and with her anxieties at an all-time high, Allie gets a visit at her front door from a local city council candidate, Kai Anderson. Allie recognizes him as that asshole that dumped coffee on her, and despite his many pleas, Allie does not let him in. Winter walks in on Allie, struggling to decide whether or not to take her anti-anxiety meds, and Winter suggests an alternative that might soothe her nerves. She runs Allie a bath and gives her a glass of wine before fully giving Ali a sponge bath that quickly heats up before things are interrupted by a block-wide blackout. Meanwhile, Oz wakes up to one of the clowns having broken into his room, but the clown assures Oz that he's only dreaming, and he just takes his word for it. Am I asleep? You're asleep. Downstairs, Harrison bangs on the door and gives his most important line of the season. Lesbians, we're under attack! What? And he warns Allie that the blackout is actually confirmed terrorism, which of course is not actually the case. Winter books it, and Allie's officially off the deep end. Oh. Clown jump scare, Ali successfully dodges two of the clowns as she retrieves her gun and her son, and the three of them head for the back door, but just then a visitor arrives and Ali pulls the trigger before even opening her damn eyes to see that the person at the door was none other than Pedro, doubling Ali's body count after her accidentally ending the life of Mr. Racist while trying to rescue him from the Dead by Daylight hook. With Pedro's sudden death, the credits roll. Episode 2 is pretty strong, even if it is a little frustrating. The blackout scene specifically executes a classic horror home invasion sequence, while also putting the audience in the same confused and anxious state that Allie herself is in, with her being fed misinformation and then left to her own devices. Harrison, Meadow, and Beverly are all formally introduced to us in this episode as well, and they are all integral pieces to the season, 
and I do think that the season is stronger with them in it than if they weren't in it. But with that being said, I think Meadow and Harrison often feel like filler characters that the writers use to fill space in the airtime or connect plot points or connect scenes or more often than not to deliver jokes when there are comedic lulls. And that's fine, but they are given a superfluous amount of quirks and personality traits that really only ever come up once or twice, and we never get a consistent read on their individual personalities. And even the show's attempts at giving these characters depth end up feeling like shallow last minute additions to their character. Comparatively, I like Beverly Hope's character a lot more, and the way she starts this season just slightly out of frame, not really integral in the plot, and then she slowly sneaks her way into being one of the most integral characters in the season. It's a really interesting thing to track as the episodes progress, but because this season is hyper fixated on the characters of Ali and Kai, pretty much every other character suffers from being underdeveloped. Because of how great of a performer Adina Porter is, I wish this character was written to have a couple layers deeper than the show gets into throughout the season, but nonetheless, Adina Porter really sells the believability of this character in her many states throughout the season. The episode is bookended with the character of Pedro, who is one of very few Hispanic characters in the season, and it seems like he's there to illustrate the effects of Donald Trump's racially charged rhetoric in many of his political speeches and just existence before, during, and after the election in 2016. Pedro also illustrates Ali's own hypocrisy and her biases, as she doesn't really take sides when Pedro is ridiculed by the chef, and after she ends up unknowingly killing Pedro. In the next episode, she gets over it mighty quick and even lashes out at the protesters who are demanding she be held accountable. Not to mention how she notices that her previous nanny disappeared without a trace and she doesn't once try to locate her or bring her up in any other context than it is inconveniencing her. And obviously once uh, Winter replaces her, she never gets brought up again. While this and Ali's hypocrisy are explored a little bit in the aftermath of Pedro's death in the next episode, this focus on Donald Trump's racist rhetoric doesn't have any presence in the remainder of the season. And that kind of rubs me the wrong way, because it feels like the writers almost checked that box off of the list in the first two episodes and felt like they never had to revisit it or make it a recurring theme throughout the season. And the fact that they felt like they don't need these characters post episode two looks and feels like a pretty half-assed attempt at including conversations about racism and immigration in the season, but I digress. The episode on its own is scary, surprising, and performances by Leslie Grossman and Billy Eichner bring a brand new sense of humor to American Horror Story that has proven to have a lasting effect on the show's darkly comedic tone in season 7 through 12. Before we move on, can we take a moment to appreciate the impeccable set design this season? The butchery on Main, the Mayfair Richards house, their bathroom, I mean come on. The sets this season simultaneously feel like they're out of a catalog, yet still feel very true to the style you'd expect the characters of Allie and Ivy to have. To that note, every set that's not supposed to look like it was decorated by the characters of Allie and Ivy looks just as spot on to its respective characters as well. Oz's bedroom is like any little kid's dream room and it fits Oz's personality as well. Kai's house, his basement specifically, feels grungy and lived in and like it hasn't been remodeled since the 70s or 80s, which is a really interesting contrast to the extremely chic and modern Mayfair Richard sets, and yeah, hats off to the set designers, set decorators, and anybody else who had a say in how these sets turned out. The set design this season was helmed by Jeff Mosa, and the lead set decorator was Claire Kaufman. In her interview with Set Decorator Society of America, Claire Kaufman says that one of her intentions with the Mayfair Richards house and the butchery was to create conflicting shapes and patterns to make a subconscious feeling of vertigo, which I must say is super effective and subtle at first, but once you look out for it, it's actually quite impressive just how layered the sets are this season with those types of details. The next episode, entitled Neighbors from Hell, opens with a new character, Rosie, who is explaining a recurring nightmare she's had of being buried alive to Brookfield Heights' only therapist, Vincent. I want to acknowledge the trauma that you're going through. 
but we learn that Vincent has helped Rosie finally overcome this phobia. That night, Rosie and her husband Mark get home where things seem to be off to a romantic start before the couple is quickly captured by the clowns that put the cult in AHS cult. The clown cult makes Rosie's nightmares her reality as both Rosie and Mark get nailed into coffins and are left for dead. And the clowns leave what is becoming their calling card, a spray-painted smiley face on the wall reminiscent of a clown. Rosie is played by Laura Allen, and this isn't her first time facing off against a killer clown as she was the star of the 2014 horror film entitled Clown. While Rosie doesn't have as much luck as Laura's character in Clown, Laura Allen did continue working in the Ryan Murphy-verse. She ended up playing Bobby's dead wife in flashback episodes of 911. So much of what this cult does is terrorize only Allie, so it's interesting to see that there are other people on their hit list and that they use similar tactics like targeting their victims' irrational fears. After the title sequence, we pick up from the end of the last episode as Allie sobs at the scene of her crime, but lucky for her, Detective Colton Haynes informs her of Michigan's Stand Your Ground law, which somehow clears her of any wrongdoing in Pedro's death. However, if you look into it, definitely does not seem like it's applicable to what Allie did at all, but clearly Brookfield Heights Police Department is making a lot of questionable calls these days. Despite this, protesters have now gathered around the butchery on Maine, demanding justice for Pedro's murder, and local newswoman Beverly Hope is on the scene, reporting on the latest scandal, hitting Brookfield Heights. Clown jump scare, Kai shows his support to Ali in a sudden change of tune, and he vows to take care of the demonstrators outside of her restaurant. Later, at home, Ali is taunted by the Wiltons, who wear sombreros and throw Taco Bell coupons at Ali in their own special Wilton brand of psychological warfare. Later that night, on the news, it turns out Kai didn't take care of those protesters, and anchorman Bob Thompson, played by Dermot Mulroney, reports on both the demonstrations outside of the butchery and the gruesome murders of Rosie and Mark. Thanks to the smiley face left on the wall, Beverly speculates that this may be the workings of a serial killer. Just as a side note about these smiley faces, some fans have made a connection to the TV show The Mentalist, which featured a serial killer with a similar calling card. In Cult, the first victim to be marked with this smiley face is none other than Councilman Tom Chang, who is played by actor Tim Kang, who just so happened to be a main cast member on The Mentalist. So so whether or not this is an intentional reference or just serendipity, the connection speaks for itself. Just then, Ali and Ivy see a truck pumping mysterious green gas down their street, and the next morning they're horrified to discover that their front yard has turned into a bird graveyard. Later, Ali and Winter settled their beef over how Winter left her in a state of panic during the blackout in the last episode, but they already have another reason to be mad at Winter since she's let a naked man into their home, as they soon discover that someone has put out a targeted Craigslist ad using their address. Later, Ali does a shitty job trying to make peace with the protesters. I'm about to go speak to the protesters. No, terrible idea. These are my people. I understand why they are so upset. I am not the enemy. I am one of you. Move, motherfuckers. But luckily, Kai finally follows through with that promise from earlier, and he seems to magically make the protesters disperse. Ali and Ivy then arrive home to meet Mr. Guinea, a guinea pig that Meadow has given to Oz, and Ali insists that Oz cannot keep him. Please say your goodbyes. I wish I could say my goodbyes to you. Allie gives a phone call to the Wiltons, who just so happen to be having a girls' night with Detective Colton Haynes. Meadow keeps the convo quick. Hello, Les. I think you're a horrible racist. And just then, the gas truck returns. Allie runs outside and stands directly in front of it before she slams her own face into a curb. Allie! The episode then cuts to a pinky to pinky meeting between Kai and Meadow, officially revealing to the audience that the Wiltons are members of Kai's cult, and since they were just hanging out with Detective Colton Haynes, it's safe to say that he's in on it as well. Later, at a family meal at the restaurant, Ali tells Oz that they can keep Mr. Guinea. Everyone rejoices, but this familial glee surrounding their new pet is short-lived as when they arrive home, a smiley face is painted on their door. 
and they arrive just in time to watch as a family as Mr. Guinea explodes in their microwave. Allie races across the street to the Wilton's house where she punches Harrison in the face and threatens Meadow before accusing them of murdering Mr. Guinea, which the Wiltons deny. Just then, the gas truck returns once again and a man exits the truck to spray chemicals specifically on Allie and Ivy's lawn. Allie confronts one of the people from the trucks and she removes their gas mask to reveal another mask underneath with that same smiley face symbol that's been painted on all the crime scenes. This is the first and the last time though that we will ever see the smiley face in the form of a mask. We then cut to Harrison's pinky to pinky meeting where he admits that marrying Meadow is his biggest regret before claiming that he does love her, but Kai pressures Harrison to go deeper and Harrison then admits that he actually wishes Meadow were dead. Ali pleads her case against the Wiltons to their bestie, Detective Colton Haynes, who clearly isn't buying it. Later, Oz comes clean to his parents about opening a link on his computer after he discovered Ivy's password to the parental controls on the computer was the word clowns with a Z, hint hint. So what is the link that Oz accidentally opened? Well, it's footage of the sponge bath between Winter and Allie, which officially cements a rift in the Allie Mayfair marriage, complete with a Ryan Murphy trademark bitch slap. <laughs> Ivy walks out on Allie and takes Oz with her, but not before the cops arrive at the Wilton's house, where Harrison is in hysterics because he claims he woke up in a pool of blood and Meadow had gone missing. And that is how episode 3 ends. Episode 3 continues to ramp up the stakes of the previous episodes, and while I don't think it's as strong as the previous episode, it provides integral setup for the next few episodes that is also entertaining, so it's not a bad episode by any means. It's more or less just more clown shenanigans and Allie being sort of a Karen, but by this episode, the show is starting to re relax into its visual style with the first true up-close-and-personal look at the season's clowns. And the episode also features a lot of on-location scenes, which I always appreciate. Before we move on though, I've yet to mention one of my favorite pieces of trivia about AHS Cult, and that is that the street in which most of this season takes place on is the same exact street that was used to to film one of my favorite films and one of horror's most iconic of all time, 1978's original Halloween, directed by John Carpenter. In fact, Ally and Ivy's house is one of the most famous houses from the classic film, as the exterior used for their house is the same one used for Tommy Doyle's house in the original Halloween, which is the house where Laurie is babysitting Tommy and Lindsay when Michael Myers comes a-knocking. And Harrison and Meadow's house is actually another iconic house from Halloween, as it's the same house where Linda and Bob were killed in the movie as well. You may not recognize it at first as it's been extensively remodeled with an entire extra half of the house added onto it, but look closely at the porch and the windows and it is a match. The use of this iconic location has got to be intentional, not just a coincidence, because Ryan Murphy himself is a well-established Halloween fan, and at the time of filming Colt, he had just wrapped up two seasons of Halloween references on Scream Queens. Clearly, he had to channel that somewhere, and I think this is where he channeled it. I think it's so intentional that the show even recreates a shot from Halloween on a couple different occasions to further emphasize significance of the filming location. Anytime Ali goes across the street to throw accusations at the Wiltons, which as you've seen has been a common occurrence at this point, it mirrors the similar shot of Laurie Strode traveling between these exact two houses in Halloween 40 years prior. As someone who calls Halloween their favorite favorite horror film and American Horror Story their favorite horror show. This is definitely one of my favorite pieces of AHS trivia that I think a lot of people may not notice or know, especially given how much a neighborhood can change aesthetically in four decades. But the rare moments where we do see characters walking those historic tree-lined streets, it hits much harder knowing that these are the same streets that John Carpenter, Deborah Hill, Jamie Lee Curtis, and the rest of the entire cast and crew changed the land landscape of horror history on all of those years ago. Episode 4 is entitled 11-9, which is in reference to November 9th, 2016, the day after the election, and this episode features a few flashbacks to that date, as well as election day itself, November 8th, 
and even some flashbacks to December of 2016. So all in all, this is a pretty shitty title, but nonetheless. The episode actually starts on November 8th, where Beverly Hope is giving one of her trademark special reports with the help of her cameraman, RJ, who is played by James Morosini, who previously had his AHS debut as the spirit chaser named Bob from the finale of Roanoke. Beverly then gets paid a visit by her adversary for the episode and special guest star, Serena Belinda, played by Emma Roberts, and the pair have a rivalry juicy enough for an entire season of Feud. This appearance marked Emma Roberts' first AHS appearance since Freak Show three years prior, and it would begin a hot streak of larger appearances in the two seasons that followed, but in the context of cult, as you'll see, Serena is truly just a candle in the wind. But anyways, back to the election day flashback. Surprise, surprise, Allie, Ivy, Winter, Harrison, and Meadow were all standing in the same line at the polling booth on election day. We then get shown who each of these characters voted for, and just for the heck of it, let's keep track. On Team Clinton, we have the cameraman RJ, Beverly Hope, Vincent the Therapist, Winter Anderson, and Ivy Mayfair Richards. And on Team Trump, it's Serena Belinda, Gary from the grocery store, with a recently amputated hand, more on that later, and Kai Anderson. For Libertarian Gary Johnson, it's Harrison Wilton, and only him. For Oprah, it's Meadow Wilton, and the sole character who voted for Jill Stein is, of course, Ali Mayfair Richards. After the title sequence, it is now November 9th, which happens to be the day when Kai and Harrison first met. At the gym that Harrison works at, Kai requests him to be his personal trainer, and Kai quickly gets to work on radicalizing good old Harry. Harrison's boss, Vinny, treats Harrison like shit, which Kai takes note of. Then, after hosing down the showers, Harrison has a, uh, steamy encounter with Kai, and as we'll see later on, Kai uses very similar tactics to radicalize Meadow as well. Speaking of Meadow, Harrison then comes home to her, and she tells him about their foreclosure that we heard about in episode 2, but I guess something new that we learn here is that the couple was homeless before taking over the Chang's lease. This is the context behind this couple's decision making at the time. They're financially desperate and scared for their future, the perfect type of vulnerable person to target if you're starting a cult like Kai. Which don't, by the way, don't do that. Later at the gym, Kai indoctrinates Harrison by convincing him to murder his boss, which Harrison does. Then Harrison freaks out as the limits of Billy Eichner's dramatic acting skills are put to the ultimate test. Fuck! I murdered someone! I'm going to jail forever! You understand? Shit! Then, at their motel room, Meadow walks in on Harrison dismembering Vinny, and she is formally introduced to Kai Anderson for the first time. Who's that? Someone to believe in. Then, in a flash forward to December 2016, Beverly and RJ are on location at a dump for a story about a recently found body which appears to be none other than Harrison's boss, Vinny. Then, anchorman Bob Thompson alludes to Beverly having recently returned from a hiatus at the news station, something that piques Kai's interest. Kai soon discovers that, shortly after the election, Beverly beat up a skateboarding teen live on air after he was a part of a series of on-air pranks pulled on Beverly. Then Bob and Serena, two ghost face killers by the way, begin to create a HR issue before Beverly enters the room to advocate for better stories for herself. Beverly accuses Serena of sleeping her way to her position at the channel and Serena expresses that she has high hopes for her own television career, which I must say sound quite similar to the aspirations of Chanel Oberlin. But I'm gonna be on the Today Show one day and I don't care how many dicks I have to suck to get there. I am a future network news anchor who's super classy and has almost no fat on her body. Anyway, Beverly goes slashing tires in the parking lot where Kai shows up and invites her out to dinner, and this is where Beverly's indoctrination begins. Just like with Harrison, Kai advocates that Beverly kill her boss, and Serena for that matter. He also reiterates his master plan of spreading fear among the masses and basically just taking power amidst all of the chaos. He then offers Beverly the chance to lead the cult by his side with equal power, but Beverly says, 
because while she does secretly want to watch the world burn, she doesn't believe that Kai can actually pull that grand of a scheme off. So she turns him down. Later, Serena reports live on the scene of the Brookfield Heights annual adoption jamboree, also around December of 2016, I'm assuming, where she's forced to pose with a dog before she finds herself surrounded by the clowns, who don't hesitate to end Emma Roberts' screen time in this season, as Serena Belinda is taken out in broad daylight. At least the dog lives, though. This might kind of be a plot hole, though, I, I don't know, but this is the cult's first use of the clown masks, and it's in broad daylight, in public, it is not live on television, we later find out that Bob refuses to let Beverly air the footage of, of Serena's death and the clowns, so it doesn't create a plot hole in that the clowns still were not public information at the time they started terrorizing Ali, but it does at least make it seem like the targeting of Ali wasn't as premeditated as it seems, because if their plan was to all along terrorize Ali and gaslight her by believing that these clowns are her own hallucination, why would they be attempting to make the clowns public information all the way back in December? But as we'll see in this episode and later on, the cult does have this kind of contradictory goal of gaslighting Ali with these clowns and also making the clowns a public presence enough to create this mass hysteria that Kai is talking about in the first place. While they are first presented to us in the show as solely vehicles to scare Ali, as they are literally designed to emulate her own personal fears, in this episode and the next one, it kind of rewrites that and says that they were instead created to create the mass hysteria that Kai wants to seize power amidst. Anyway, we then get some backstory on the clown masks, which I do appreciate. In-universe, Meadow is the one who designed them, and I guess she's always wanted to be an artist. But again, in this scene, she is designing these clown masks to create mass hysteria. And at least in this scene, it isn't presented that she is designing these with any knowledge of Ali's fears, although it is kind of a gray area whether or not the cult was actively targeting Ali at this time around December of 2016. Also, everything we learn about the Wiltons feels like it's just being added into the season just to later be dropped. The bees, the guns, the Nicole Kidman fan club, the skin cancer, Meadows' artistic aspirations, all of those things get mentioned at most two times before never being brought up ever again. During this design session, Beverly Hope barges in, knowing that Kai was behind Serena's murder. And due to this act, Beverly now claims that she does believe in him, and she accepts his offer of equal power in the cult. We then see Beverly Beverly reporting on the discovery of Vinny's severed head, and it's now evident that Kai Anderson had control of the local media since December 2016, and remember most of this season's events take place in March of 2017. The episode then cuts confusingly back in time to the day before the election again, where Ali refuses to go to a Hillary Clinton rally with Ivy, and the pair have a debate about Ali's reluctance to vote Hillary, which at the time she feels justified in expressing because she believes that there's no way that Hillary won't win the election. Ivy goes alone to the rally where she argues with Gary, the Trump supporter cashier from the grocery store, which ends with him assaulting her. Winter witnesses this and defends Ivy, but Gary gets away in his Fields Market truck. That's right, Gary's truck has the actual logo of Fields Market, the very real grocery store where they filmed those scenes at the grocery store, but if I were them, I wouldn't want American Horror Story to be associating my store with uh, Gary's actions, even if they're fictional. This isn't the last time that this happens in the season either. Anyways, Winter catches up with Ivy, and the two grab a bite at the butchery, where they hatch a plan to kidnap Gary, and they proceed to do exactly that. After handcuffing him to a pipe in the basement, Ivy and Winter tell Gary to get woke and except that the country will soon have a female president. For the first time in history, a woman will be your commander-in-chief. It'll never happen! Get woke! Later, Kai notices the blood on Winter's face, and she confesses everything. He then pays Gary a visit, and advises that Gary saw off his own hand so that he can be free from the handcuffs and go vote. And, as we saw earlier, Gary does this, and the episode ends with that gory scene. 11-9 is not my favorite, nor my least favorite episode of the season. The episode's back in forth timeline and lack of focus on the actual date in the title is just a little bit annoying to me 
and I can't help but to think they could have presented these scenes in a more digestible and chronological order. That being said, the scenes centered around Beverly, Bob, and Serena are really fun because these three are just giving completely different performances that somehow work together so well to communicate a vibe of workplace tension that is both disturbing and humorous. Emma Roberts is not truly playing Serena Belinda, she is playing Madison Montgomery, she is playing Chanel Oberlin, and goddammit, there is a reason why she plays so many of these roles. She is a master at it. Episode 5 is called Holes, and it opens with another special report from Beverly Hope, this time on Meadow Wilton's disappearance. Later, Bob criticizes Beverly's report for having, well, holes in it. There's all sorts of goddamn holes in your stories. And he also raises some fair questions about how Beverly is always the first on the scene of many of these crimes. Bob then fires Beverly, but Beverly counters that with some good old-fashioned blackmail. You sure you want to force me to call a press conference and talk about the many times I saw you sexually harassing the dead girl? So Beverly can keep her job, and the clowns may just have a new target on their clown hands. Later, at a modest cult meeting, Kai explains why obtaining the seat on the city council is so integral to his plan. Who cares if Kai's on city council? Because the perception of credibility leads to the perception of power. And also, the city council election is the only one going on. Because city council is the only goddamn election available, that leader is going to have to be a goddamn city councilman. Which begs the question, Kai, why didn't you, like, kill the mayor or something? Anyway, Harrison claims that people just aren't scared enough, so Kai suggests making the murders more scary, more satanic. Beverly, though, claims that they already have the makings of some city-wide panic with those godforsaken clown masks. But since the public has never seen those, Kai and company are essentially just putting on a show for nobody but themselves. Once again, the show is contradicting itself with the true intention behind the masks, but anyway, the idea of filming the next murder is put on the table. One of the cult members arrives late to the meeting and, drumroll, it's Ivy. What'd I miss? No matter how predictable this and some other cult-related reveals are in this season, they still work for me somehow, and the slow burn realization that Ali's really been targeted by everyone she is close to is very unsettling, and Sarah Paulson's performance really drives that anxiety home. And that is particularly evident in this next scene, where Ali has a nightmare where she's covered in holes that have bugs running back and forth like Scooby-Doo characters. Speaking of the holes, I forgot to mention this earlier, all of Ali's phobias in the season were actually inspired by real phobias that Sarah Paulson has, a fact that got brought up a lot in the press tour for this season. In a therapy session with Dr. Vincent, Ali is heartbroken over not being able to see Oz aside from scheduled visits, and she blames herself for allowing what happened with Winter to tear her marriage apart. Ali begins to put some things together though, reflecting on the current financial conundrum she finds herself in, with Ivy having cancelled all of the cards and Ali being responsible for paying the lease of the restaurant. The speed at which Ivy completely withdrew herself from Ali's life causes Ali to suspect that maybe there was more planning put into Ivy's departure. Meanwhile, Ivy and Winter discuss how they essentially orchestrated the whole cheating thing and how the cult is ramping up for action and shit's about to get real. This isn't knitting a pink pussy hat and marching with a clever sign. This is radical action. Radicals are the only people who've ever gotten anything done. I'm ready. Then the clown cult breaks into Bob Thompson's house, kills him, and chant a satanic chant, all while capturing the crime on video. There's also a guy in the attic, but I can't really show any of that without being demonetized, so go ahead and watch the show if you don't remember the guy in the attic. My advice is you don't, especially if you're squeamish, because it's seriously one of the grossest scenes in the history of the show. I might even say it is the grossest scene in the history of the show. Nothing comes to mind that's quite grosser than this. But in terms of prosthetics, 
prosthetic work, it's actually a remarkable feat. During that scene, which I must heavily blur, we begin to see exactly who is behind each of these clown masks, something that hadn't been made entirely clear before this episode. So let's break it down. The penis clown is Kai, of course, and under the elephant donkey hybrid mask is Ivy, the one with the hands is Beverly, the rainbow puzzle piece one is Winter, the one with the Donald Trump hair is RJ, and the one with the exposed brain is Detective Colton Haynes, and the holy one with the green hair is Harrison. She's not in the scene, but by process of elimination, the one with the fierce bob must be Meadow. After putting an axe through his skull, Beverly Hope reports on Bob Thompson's death with a heavy heart, and she proceeds to air the footage of Bob's death. Bob had previously not let Beverly air the footage of her dear colleague Serena's death, but with him out of the way, Kai, through Beverly, now has a clear path to spreading that chaos and mass hysteria he's been rambling on and on about for the the previous four episodes. Sometime later, at the butchery on Maine, Kai and Beverly reflect on their latest murder and how some of their fellow cult members are a bit too squeamish when it comes to this whole murder thing. We then flash back five weeks to the night of the coffin murders, where both Meadow and RJ express that what they're doing is pretty messed up. Back in the present, Beverly and Kai determine that both RJ and Meadow's weakness need to be squashed. Then Ali spies on Harrison from across the street, where it seems that he may be disposing of a body while also catching some heat from Detective Colton Haynes. So Ali decides to go investigate with her baseball bat, and sure enough, she finds Meadow alive in a freshly dug grave, begging for her help. Allie then retreats back to her house where Meadow follows her and begs to be let in. Meadow then decides to spill the beans to Ali, revealing that she's being targeted by a cult that everyone is a part of, the police, Winter, and even Ivy. It's a cult, Allie, and everyone's in it. The police, my husband, your babysitter, your wife. No, no, please, please. Just then, Meadow is grabbed and taken off screen. Later at a cult meeting, the plan seems to be working as Winter reveals that Kai is now in the lead for the city council seat following the clown masks making their first public appearance. Amped up from that statistic, Kai leads his followers to their next mission, murdering the weakling RJ together as a group with a nail gun. Of course, this is another particularly brutal scene, which I won't be able to show unblurred, but damn, rest in peace, RJ, you really did not deserve to be the first boot of this cult. From this point on, the season really ups the body count, with several major characters biting the dust at the service of, or in service against, this gosh darn clown cult. Later, at a one-on-one -on -one pinky sesh between Kai and Beverly, she asks for answers about his past, and more specifically, his parents. So Kai tells her their story. The Andersons were toxic, to say the least, before their story tragically ended with murder. Kai kept his parents' deaths a secret, though, and his brother, pause for dramatic effect, Dr. Vincent, revealed, and you never saw it coming, baby. Helped him cover up their deaths by essentially keeping them in their bedroom forever as a sort of mausoleum. It's some very dark stuff, but it appears that this is at least part of the reason why Kai is the way he is. And I appreciate the show giving us this backstory, even though it is horrendous and disturbing to watch. I do wish, however, the season would give an equivalent to show Ali's past, whether it be her previous triggers or as far back as her own childhood. I think. I think while we do get this context with Kai's character, I think it's a little odd that we don't get similar context with Ali's character, given that these two characters are the leads. But to that point, this second half of the season definitely feels like Ali takes the back seat and Kai becomes the main character, which provides for some interesting insights into Kai's character, but unfortunately that is at the expense of Ali's character. But that, my friends, is how episode 5 ends. <laughs> <laughs> and
And when Winter said shit is about to get real, she was absolutely right, as the next week hits us with another one of those classic AHS episode 6s, with many twists and turns along the way that kickstart the tail end of the season, which I must say, no matter how I feel about the remainder of the season, it is much more action-packed when compared to the episodes we just finished talking about, so I foresee a lot of tangents. This episode is probably my favorite of the season. It continues the momentum from two episodes ago before the flashback episode, and we finally get to revel in the interworkings of Kai's clown cult, as well as indulge in Ali finally realizing that she is not crazy, but instead she is being psychologically manipulated by her wife with the aid of an extremely dangerous cult. Because this is the first time we get to see so many of the cult members behind the masks, we get to see so many different layers to a lot of characters. Kai, Winter, Ivy, Beverly, and RJ, just to name a few, they deserved more time to be fleshed out further before the season moves on from the clowns entirely. While episode 6 does serve as a continuation of this episode, the cult scenes in episode 5 far outweigh the ones in episode 6, but on the other hand, in episode 6 we get a lot more alley scenes which do outweigh the ones in episode 5, so depending on which of these elements you prefer more, it's in both of these episodes. I just wish it could have been stretched out even further because to me this is when the season is really at its best. Episode 6 is also way better at portraying Ali as an active protagonist for the first time in the season. But before we get into that episode, let's first break down all that we learned about the clowns in this episode. Now, since we got a closer look at the identities of the clowns in this episode, I want to take a moment to appreciate both the creation of these clown masks, as well as speculate on the potential meetings behind them. Mike McCash has been a part of the makeup department on AHS since season 1, as has Aaron Kruger McCash, his wife, with a specialization in prosthetics. In Cult, though, the tasks of the makeup department broadened as they were responsible for the creation of the clown masks. While the masks themselves were designed by Mike McCash and the special effects department, the clown's costumes were designed by Luca Nemolato and the costume department. Mike also designed the comic books we see a couple times throughout the season featuring Twisty and honestly go off because visually those are some of the best parts of the season. On his Instagram, Mike McCash revealed a few scrapped clown designs for Colt, even revealing that at one point Ryan Murphy looked at around 70 clown mask concepts in one day. If that means that there's at least that many scrapped clown designs out there, I beg you Mike, please share the rest with the world because all of these designs were truly delivering and it's very interesting to see which ones made the cut and which ones didn't. Doing research for this video, I found an old Reddit post by someone named The Great Escaper who offers up some strong pieces of symbolism in each of these masks. So let's take each mask one by one and see what he had to say. Kai's penis mask, also known as the Ice Cream Man, consists of many faces conveying different emotions which reflects how Kai manipulates the emotions of his followers and how Kai himself presents himself with different faces or personas at different points in the season. Additionally, the many faces allow the mask to literally have eyes everywhere, which is something that Kai definitely wants to promote to his followers. Also, in episode 4's flashbacks to before the creation of the clown masks, Winter refers to Trump supporters as dick faces, claiming that they think they can get away with anything. I mean, Trump and those dick faces feel like they can get away with anything. This is not normal. Speaking of Winter, her mask is the puzzle one, who the Great Escaper calls Jigsaw, and he notes that the puzzle pieces do not fit together nicely, but they're instead stitched together by force. He thinks Jigsaw's mask is a representation of the cult itself, as it is made up of people from all sides of the political spectrum who are forcibly brought together. He also notes how Winter herself is a bit of a puzzle, given her traumatic past with her family and the complicated relationship she has with Kai, let alone her actions within the cult going against against her own personal ideologies. To me, I interpret the mask as a representation of Winter, not the cult, who is a living contradiction of herself, and her intentions are truly mysterious, but this is likely a result of how her upbringing was negatively affected by abuse, addiction, and the sudden and violent death of her parents, which then forced her into being at least somewhat dependent on her older brother, who himself is physically and emotionally abusive and manipulative. So Winter is this living 
contradiction because of those circumstances forcing her into situations where she sacrifices parts of her true self. Kai's villainy is in your face, but Winter's also shown to be quite fucked up in her own right. With her indoctrination of Oz, Sure, she may have been ordered by Kai to do it, but you can see that she doesn't appear to ever feel bad about the things she's doing. Harrison's mask is the one with the holes, obviously playing into Ali's trypophobia, but also in the episode entitled Holes, we are shown Harrison's backstory and how he was indoctrinated into the cult by Kai essentially filling some of the holes in his life in more ways than one. Being the one with all of the holes may be drawing some subtle attention to his origin story in that episode. Detective Colton Haynes wears the brains mask, which the Great Escaper says represents how a detective is seen as the brains of an investigation, and how Detective Colton himself was the lead investigator of many of the cult's crimes. And I'll go one step further and say that it's that the mask serves as a bit of irony, as the character himself is shown to actually be quite stupid. He is a full-blown neo-Nazi corrupt cop who is too consumed by his own perception of masculinity to admit that he's gay, even after he has accepted the company of a male lover. Clearly, something is not all right upstairs for the detective. Beverly Hope's mask is known as the pentagram, whose pentagram and hands in the shape of horns is the most demonic of the clown masks, and honestly, it's the least clown-like. But in addition to its holes, it evokes satanic or demonic imagery, which the great escaper says may be in reference to how Beverly herself is through with playing Mrs. Nice Gal after years of being mistreated by Bob and the news station, and now, as a quote-unquote co-head of this cult, she's willing to do anything to get what she wants, no matter how evil her actions may appear. The elephant mask, which in the Trick or Treat Studios collection he is known as Flip Flop, is worn by Ivy, and it actually has a donkey on the backside. The Great Escaper theorizes that this dual-sided mask represents how the Republicans and Democrats are incapable of truly seeing each other. Other. It could also be read that the two parties are two sides of the same coin. And with the elephant facing front and Ivy being the one who wears it for most of the season, it is another bit of irony. Meadow wears the ball gag mask, which is the most overtly sexual mask, second only to good old penis face. We learn that Meadow is quite sexually repressed and she feels silenced a few times throughout the season. So while the ball gag is a direct contrast to her own sex life, it also functions as a vivid illustration of how she truly feels inside which is made even more poignant when you realize that she designed this costume for herself. RJ wears the mask known as Kooks, which has one major difference when compared to the other masks. It is the only one made of fabric, whereas all of the other ones appear to be made out of plastic. RJ, of course, ends up being killed by his fellow cult members for Kai perceiving him as being too weak or too human to handle the more gruesome parts of being the cult. So, unlike the people that ended up killing him who wear plastic masks with exaggerated colors, RJ has a more natural skin color and a more form-fitting fabric mask, symbolizing how he is the most human of the gang. This is as far as the Reddit post goes, but I want to go slightly further and say that each of these masks portray a quality that is likely perceived by them to be a negative, but that very quality is what Kai uses to get out of them what he wants. Winter's fractured personality makes her completely completely malleable to Kai for a large part of the season. The holes in Harrison's life before he met Kai are what keep him from ever straying. The detective's lack of brains yet clear thirst for power makes him the perfect weapon for Kai, all while being incredibly easy to manipulate. Beverly's villainous desires are something she used to try and keep hidden, and her job previously shamed her for fighting back against repeated instances of on-air abuse. And I think part of that shame for her actions still exists in her, even once she's fully left her good girl news reporter persona behind. Ivy's double-sided mask, sure, definitely represents the two parties, but I think it also represents how Ivy herself is two-faced. She is a hypocrite. The whole reason she joined the cult was because she resented Allie for being Oz's birth mother. So what she then does is sabotage Allie's bond with Oz so that Oz will only see Ivy as his true mother. She does the same exact thing that she accuses Allie of doing to her. She later scolds Allie for voting third party, yet to get back at Allie, she's willing to aid in the rise of a far-right cult-leading politician. 
Kai brings out this hypocrisy in Ivy, and much like Kai in Winter, it's hard to say which of Ivy's many faces is her true one. In the next episode, you'll see how Meadow's sexual repression is used as a tactic for Kai to manipulate her to do some pretty extreme things, and RJ's humanity, as I've stated, is exploited by Kai as he uses him as an example to try and weed out any similar sentiment amongst the other clowns. There is also Gary's mask, which aside from featuring more holes, I can't really find any solid symbolic meaning behind, so feel free to put your best guesses in the comments below. In 2018, Trick or Treat Studios released a collection of Halloween masks based on the cult ones. In fact, they even claimed that the masks themselves were made from the master molds that were used to make the ones on the show. And by the looks of them, they do look pretty close to the ones in cult. For the collection, the masks offered were holes, puzzle face, flip-flop, ball gag, and brainiac. Alright, now let's get into episode 6, which is entitled Midwestern Assassin, and it begins with a mass shooting at a crowded rally for Kai Anderson. There was a disclaimer at the beginning of the video, but just as further disclaimer, for this episode, the topic of mass shootings does get brought up at a couple points for the next about 10 minutes. The edit in this scene is a little weird, and that could be for a couple reasons, but many characters we know are present at this shooting, Meadow, Harrison, Ali, Ivy, and Kai, of course, who gets shot in the leg. Back when this aired, and even on further rewatches, I always thought that Dr. Vincent was also in this scene, as there's a guy that looks just like him trying to help Ivy before um, he himself gets shot, but I can say with confidence that it is not Cheyenne Jackson in the scene, it is just an extra who just happens to look a lot like him. I don't know if anybody else ever thought this, but I definitely did at one point in time. But anyway, once authorities arrive, Ali is holding the gun, and she is subsequently apprehended. The episode will go on to give us a lot more context on this rather out of the blue scene, but first let's take a moment to discuss why this edit may seem a little weird, and unfortunately it is due to a real life mass shooting that occurred just three days before the episode was set to air. On October 1st, 2017, the deadliest mass shooting by a lone gunman in American history occurred and naturally, the nation was in complete shock. The airing of this particular episode being scheduled so closely to this national tragedy obviously put FX and the AHS team in a tricky spot, so the solution they landed on was to basically proceed with caution. The episode aired on FX with an edited down version of the scene, which basically erases the two on-screen deaths that are in the full version, one of an innocent bystander and the other one being the Extra who I think looks like Cheyenne Jackson. The version aired on FX also removed the close-up shots of the gun itself, ultimately removing 45 seconds of the original scene, putting the emphasis on Ivy's reactions to what was happening rather than the more vivid portrayals of gun violence. FX also released this statement the night prior to the episode's airing, noting that the unedited cut of the episode would be made available on services like iTunes, as well as the network's two streaming services that were up at at the time, FX Now and FX Plus. If you've ever rewatched the episode after it aired, the full version, uncensored, is probably the version of the scene you've seen. Anyways, the episode then flashes backwards and picks up where we left Allie in the previous episode after Meadow spilled the clown cult's beans and was subsequently kidnapped before our very eyes. Allie then breaks into the Wilton's house, and she steals Harrison's keys as he gets it on with Detective Colton Haynes. Allie finds Meadow, and she ends up getting the both of them caught. But thanks to Allie's mace, the pair manage to get away and take refuge at the butchery, where Ali grills Meadow for further answers regarding this cult. You need to tell me what the hell is going on here. And Meadow reveals how Ivy was integral to pulling off every one of the cult's breaking and entries into her home, 
and she also claims that at least part of Ivy's motive was Allie's decision to vote for Jill Stein in the election. Meadow also reveals that Allie is just one of many projects that the cult is working on, although we never really see any further evidence of this. Aside from Rosie, the cult really seems to be focusing on driving Allie insane, winning the city council election, and spreading mass hysteria through serial murders of people that have ended up on the cult's bad side. Come to think of it, Rosie and Mark are really an anomaly when you line up all of their victims. Everybody else has a reason to be targeted by the cult, like they wronged one of the members in some way. But what did Rosie do? Meadow says that this is all just the foundation for the cult's eventual takeover, and this is all being done by the orders of Kai Anderson, who it just so happens Meadow fell desperately in love with. This desperate crush is something Kai definitely used to manipulate Meadow as we are shown in a flashback montage. But when Meadow witnessed him reusing some of his lines on Ivy, Meadow tells Allie that this was when she knew she wanted out. And this rift between Meadow and Kai is apparently what has led us to the events of this episode. After dumping all of that onto Allie, Meadow then proposes that the two of them assassinate Kai. We have to kill him. Then at a town hall, Kai is fact-checked by a woman in the crowd named Sally Keffler, a late write-in candidate for city council who calls Kai out for exactly what he is. I think you're a snake oil salesman. And not even a very good one. You're just trying to make these people scared. You're damn right I am. And she clearly wins over this crowd. People like Mr. Anderson and Trump, they are the flies that the garbage has drawn. It's time that we stop worrying about the flies and we start hauling away the garbage. <laughs> Sally is played by special guest star Mayor Winningham in what is her fourth and final appearance in AHS, at least as of 2024, after her memorable roles in Coven, Freak Show, and Hotel. Then in another flashback to November 9th, the day after the election, Ivy panics after seeing an escaped Gary at the polls. Kai then calls Ivy in for her first pinky to pinky meeting where she reveals her deep deep hatred for her wife which truly stems much deeper than Allie's decision at the polls. For the first time, the show reveals to us that Allie was Oz's birth mother, and Allie getting to experience pregnancy and childbirth led to Ivy developing some serious feelings of jealousy and resentment. This was amplified by Allie referring to Oz as her child, not theirs, among other decisions that removed Ivy from the picture at certain moments throughout Oz's childhood. At this first pinky meeting between Ivy and Kai, Kai promises Ivy that she will be free from Ali, and not only will she be granted full custody of Oz after they terrorize Ali until she's completely out of her mind, but Ivy will also get to be with Winter. Definitely weird that Kai is setting up his sister with Ivy against her will, but clearly there's a lot of fucked up things about this situation that the show just moves right past. Allie takes Meadow to Dr. Vincent to prove to him that she's not crazy. For once, she is able to prove to her doctor that she is not acting from a place of fear, and she storms out of his office to run some errands while Dr. Vincent can babysit her escaped kidnappee. Allie then visits Sally Keffler and spills the beans about Kai and his cult, likening him to a modern-day Charles Manson. He's like a, a modern-day Charles Manson. Sally says she's not surprised, and she shares her deep knowledge of cult leaders of the past with Allie, claiming these types of cult leaders always rise in moments where the patriarchy is threatened. She foreshadows the trajectory of the rest of the season beyond this episode, name-dropping not only Charles Manson, but Jim Jones and David Koresh, all of whom will appear before our very eyes soon enough. Hmm? This is the kind of shit that happens whenever the patriarchy is threatened. Manson was a product of the 60s. Women's lib, the pill. Jim Jones, too. It's no coincidence that Koresh went up against Janet Reno. Ali is baffled that Sally believes her, but just then, the entire cult breaks into Sally's house. Ali hides in the bathroom, and while Sally attempts to fend them off with her handgun, she is unfortunately overpowered by the killer clowns from the United States. Kai unmasks himself to Sally, ghostwrites her final Facebook post, and then that is the end of poor Sally. Ivy stumbles upon Allie's hiding spot, and Allie somehow recognizes her, despite Ivy being in her full elephant clown costume. 
Ivy? And Ivy decides to spare Allie by leaving her alone and not alerting the rest of the cult about her presence. After surviving that run-in, Allie returns to Dr. Vincent, but Meadow is already gone. He tells her he wants her to check herself into a mental hospital, and she tells him, Fuck you. We then find ourselves at that fateful Kai Anderson rally from the start of the episode, where, by the way, this banner seems to be reusing a photo of Tate Langdon. Which, hey, I think that's as good of a time as any to bring up this small piece of trivia from Murder House. In the very first script for the pilot episode of American Horror Story, Tate Langdon, played by Evan Peters, is compared to a cult leader. Back to the episode, Allie locates Meadow in the crowd and tries to catch up with her, but she is too late after Meadow fires many shots. Allie then tries to take the gun from Meadow's hand, but she is unable to before Meadow professes that she's done all of this for love, and she then takes her own life. Then, the episode flashes back to earlier in the Kai-Meadow conflict, where we see that Kai once again used Meadow's feelings for him to reel her back in before the rally, thus revealing that the entirety of this episode's events with Allie and Meadow went exactly according to Kai's plan, assassination attempt and all. The episode then ends with Allie being taken into custody. Speaking on how intense the filming of the shooting scene was, Leslie Grossman had this to say. When I got the script that I was going to be committing a mass shooting, yeah. that was a little surprising. It's surprising. I had um, like a five minute panic attack mm -hmm. when I first read it and mm -hmm. I was like, how am I going to do this? Oh my right. gosh. But we got through it. What was it like shooting a dramatized mass shooting in this country with everything that's going on? I'm going to be honest with you, yeah. it wasn't fun mm -hmm. and it was, it was difficult for me. Mm -hmm. I've never held a gun. Right. Me either. Well, Me either. You know what? Good for us. Yeah. Um, I, I'm proud of this. It obviously wasn't a real gun right. when I was shooting, but I mean, the first couple takes, my heart was pounding out right. of my chest. It felt really uncomfortable for me. Uh -huh. Even the pared down was still pretty it's intense. Very scary. Because you know what? They shot it to feel real. Mm -hmm. And it's what's happening. It's right. a mirror to our society right now. So right. people that were upset would say, why would you sensationalize that? I don't think it was about sensationalizing mm -hmm. it. I think it was like, hey, guess what? This mm -hmm. is what's happening every day all the time. Much like other episode 6s in AHS, this episode marks a shift in the season, where episodes 1 through 5 are a character study about a liberal who descends into madness at the hands of the people she trusts, and a conservative who uses fear to gain power in a small town. Episodes 6 through 11 depict an internal battle within the cult of many different forces trying to take Kai down, while simultaneously indulging in several historical flashbacks to many real cult members to mimic the various stages of Kai's rise. Personally, I like this episode, specifically all of Ali's scenes and all of Sally Keffler's scenes, but one gripe I do have with it is that I think Meadow was kind of wasted in this season thanks to this episode. Everything we previously knew about her was replaced in this episode with an expansive backstory on all of the ways that Kai manipulated her romantically and sexually, just for her to then devote her entire life to his cause as the shooter at the rally. The revelation that Meadow was the shooter is treated like a twist in the episode, but like I said earlier, they show that Meadow was the shooter in the first scene. Even if the editors had some extenuating circumstances, the episode is well written and well performed, of course. Leslie Grossman and Evan Peters sell those scenes completely and believably, so the episode works for what it's trying to do. I just wish that Meadow was given a stronger arc, even if it had to end this way. Episode 7 is entitled Valerie Solanas Died for Your Sins Scumbag, and depending on who you ask, it is one of the most controversial episodes of the franchise, and a primary element of this controversy is that this episode stars Lena Dunham. Now, I am not going to get into any of her personal controversies, and I'll just take the episode for what it is to see if the episode is overhated because of people's own feelings towards the actress, or if the episode itself did, in fact, take some significant missteps. The episode opens on June 3rd, 1968, with Valerie Solanas, played by Dunham, who purchases bullets and pays none other than Andy Warhol a visit. Warhol is played by Evan Peters in his second role in 
in the season, and he is then confronted by Valerie over a script of hers that she wants to be made. But Warhol turns her down, telling her that women can't be serious artists. This enrages Valerie, and she is escorted out of the building. Valerie comes back later that day, though, and she shoots Andy Warhol. As you may have guessed, this episode revolves around a dramatic retelling of real-life events, as Valerie Solanus and Andy Warhol were both real people, and this episode is at least partly based on true events. Andy Warhol, of course, was a prolific visual artist and filmmaker of primarily the 60s and 70s, and Valerie Solanus was considered to be a radical feminist known for what was just depicted on the show, but also for writing the Scum Manifesto, with Scum standing for the Society for Cutting Up Men. The manifesto blames men for all that's wrong in the world, and suggests that women rise up and form an organization called Scum that would overthrow the patriarchy, even advocating for the elimination of men altogether. Watch this space because for the rest of the season, Scum is kind of a big deal. After the title sequence, the show returns to present day 2017 with a news report surprisingly not featuring Beverly Hope, which includes an interview with Harrison Wilton who gives an intention to Meadows' violent actions at the rally. She wrote at length in her diary about her anger over Hillary Clinton's loss, vowing payback against Trump supporters. She specifically mentioned Kai Anderson as her target. Meanwhile, as he recovers in the hospital, news breaks that Kai has officially won the seat on the Brookfield Heights City Council. Beverly Hope clocks out for the day, but before she can enter her car, she must face a special guest star. This special guest star is none other than Frances Conroy, playing a character by the brilliant name of B.B. Babbitt. A bullshit puppet. I can see your strings. You've lost your way. B.B. Babbitt smokes a cigar and wears a green velvet cloak. And now, to give you a brief rundown of Frances Conroy's history with American Horror Story, please welcome our own special guest star, fellow AHS YouTuber Kane Varner. Hello everybody, I am so excited to get the chance to yap about one of my favorite actresses in American Horror Story history, that being Frances Conroy. Let's not kid ourselves, Frances Conroy has some of the most varied characters out of any American Horror Story actor. Part of what makes seeing our beloved Franny on our screens almost every single season so exciting is her unmatched ability to make every single performance of hers a standout in that season, even if she has a subdued role. B.B. Babbitt in Cult is one of Frances's eight appearances in American Horror Story, which makes her one of only five actors to appear in that many seasons. Behind only Sarah Paulson, Evan Peters, Lily Rabe and Dennis O'Hare, who she's tied with. Frances Conroy's first role in the show obviously dates back all the way to our beloved Murder House, where she played the older version of Moira O'Hara, a role which she earned an Emmy nomination for, but she'd end up losing the nomination to Jessica Lange, who had an American Horror Story role of her own that year in Constance Langdon. Frances would continue her AHS run in Asylum, where she played the Angel of Death, a Grim Reaper-like entity who appears before its victims to deliver a kiss of death. The next year, Frances would return for her first role in AHS's main ensemble, this time playing the incomparable Myrtle Snow. Any last word? Only one. The leader of the Witch's Council and rival to Jessica Lange's Fiona, a dynamic that feels similar to the pair's roles in Murder House. And just like in that season, Frances Conroy would receive another Emmy nomination, this time for the role of Myrtle, and she similarly lost the nomination to Kathy Bates, this time who would win for Delphine Lalaurie. Freak Show found Frances playing another main role, this time Gloria Mott, who is a wealthy widow and mother to to Dandy Mott. The following year would mark Frances's first absence from the show as she decided to sit hotel out, much like her co-star Jessica Lange. But she wouldn't stay gone for too long as she would return in Roanoke, this time in a guest starring role playing Mama Polk in the reenactment portion of the season. And just like her previous role, she is yet again playing the mother of Finn Witchrock, at least in the context of the reenactments. So we finally made it to B.B. Babbitt in Cult, which would be 
her sixth role at the time, but she would appear in the next season, Apocalypse, for an extended run as everyone's favorite Myrtle Snow, as well as Moira O'Hara in the Return to Murder House episode. Lastly, she would appear in the first half of Double Feature, titled Red Tide, as Sarah Cunningham, aka Belle Noir. The character is seen by a lot of people as having a lot of wasted potential, and I can't really agree more. I mean, it, she was so strong in the first few episodes, but then the writers just kind of forgot about her by the end, and her final few scenes in the finale just really don't do the character justice in my opinion, which harkens back to the fact that Double Feature should have been one season. But I digress. In the early days of American Horror Story, Ryan Murphy would boast about how he would write drastically different roles for all of his actors so that no two characters would be similar at all. And while this is evident for most actors throughout the first six seasons, Francis Conroy's eight roles are truly the embodiment of that intention, as none of her characters are similar to each other whatsoever. Personally, Francis Conroy is in my top five actors in American Horror Story. She's one of my personal favorite actors outside the show as well. Her chemistry with actors such as Jessica Lange, Sarah Paulson, Evan Peters should not be understated. Because Frances Conroy's characters were so different, it oftentimes led to more diversity within the relationships between recurring actors that she would have shared scenes with in other seasons. I mean, just take, for instance, her role here in Cult. She shares a lot of scenes with Evan Peters, who is playing, obviously, Kai Anderson. And while while Evan Peters certainly has diversity within his acting ability and with certain roles, he is playing another murderous, psychopathic character. So her rapport with Evan Peters in Murder House while she was playing Moira is a lot different than her rapport here with Kai while she was playing B.B. Babbitt. It just speaks to Frances Conroy as an actress to be able to have the range to pull all of these characters off. Thanks a lot for that breakdown, Kane. If you've never checked out his channel, definitely go over there and subscribe because he's got a ton of great long-form content on not only AHS, but lots of other topics as well. Be sure to look out for his upcoming video on the visual decline of American Horror Story, which is coming soon because you might just see a familiar face. But back to episode 7, Beverly goes to Kai's place to discover he's significantly heightened his security with several new uniformed guards. Kai claims these men are all volunteers from across the country devoted to his cause. Now that Kai has won this seat on city council, he claims he now wants to provide law and order to his constituents, and these blue shirts are part of that effort. Beverly, who still wants to watch the world burn, calls out that Kai's goals have suddenly shifted. With this new rift between Kai and Beverly, it's clear that the pair no longer have that illusion of equal power as co-heads of the cult. And awkwardly, it appears that Ivy is st still using the butchery as a safe house for her and the cult, even though Allie's also been using it for her own safe house. And Allie definitely has more of a right to it, since when Ivy left, she dumped the restaurant's lease entirely on Allie. But that's besides the point, as Beverly then shows up with B.B. Babbitt, who explains that she is a modern-day supporter of Scum, largely because she was a close friend and lover of Valerie Solanus back in their heyday. Then, in a flashback with Valerie, and a young BB, we are treated to two other special guest stars, the first of which being Jamie Brewer, whose history of AHS is too iconic to not do a little deep dive into it real quick. As a part of the inaugural season of AHS, Jamie played one of the season's most iconic and heartbreaking roles, Adelaide Langdon, the daughter of Constance. While she was only billed as a recurring cast member for this season, her role is just as impactful as many of the main ones in Murder House. Then, after taking Asylum off, Jamie Brewer returned for AHS Coven to portray what I'd say is her best and most iconic role on the show, Nan, a clairvoyant witch. Nan is another recurring role that definitely feels deserving to be included with the main ensemble. In Freak Show, Jamie plays Marjorie, the hallucinated personality of Chester Krebs' ventriloquist dummy, and while it was a comparatively small role, it is a hard one to forget. Chronologically, Jamie Brewer's next AHS role would be Cult, where she plays Hedda, a scum supporter in attendance of this meeting where Valerie is reading from her manifesto. In comparison to Jamie's roles that came before, I would definitely say this one is more of a cameo, as she simply doesn't get extensive moments of screen time in the episode 
episode, but given that her inclusion in the season was kept a complete secret before this episode aired, her appearance in this episode was definitely a pleasant surprise. Hedda would not be Jamie Brewer's final AHS role, though, as she would return the next year for Apocalypse, where she reprised Nan for a couple of memorable episodes. And in the show's spin-off, American Horror Stories, Jamie Brewer reprised her murder house character of Adelaide in a video game version of AHS that itself is within a timeline alternate to AHS's own. It's very confusing. That's kind of the episode's entire gimmick, aside from being pretty terrible. Please get Jamie Brewer back for AHS 13 or a better American Horror Stories episode, because that should not be her final appearance in the series. Back to the scum meeting, another person in attendance is a character named Butchie May, played by Dot Marie Jones, in her AHS debut. You definitely know her though for other roles like Coach Beast in Glee, or her later AHS role as State Trooper Jan in Double Feature. At the meeting, the show really amps up Valerie's thirst for violence advocating for not only the murder of men, but also their girlfriends. And here's where the show starts to take some real creative liberties. Scum collectively then commits a murder of a couple in a park, and back in the present day, Winter notes that that very couple were the first victims of the Zodiac Killer, and she protests that Scum couldn't have been the true Zodiac Killer. But BB insists that not only were Scum behind the first murder attributed to the Zodiac Killer, but we were the Zodiac. Side note, this marks the return of the Zodiac Killer in the AHS universe after its appearance in Hotel's Devil's Night episode, where the infamous killer's identity remained a mystery. Some people say that Colt revealing that Scum was the Zodiac Killer is a plot hole, since in Hotel, the Zodiac Killer is shown as one person, but let's just say it's really Valerie's ghost under that mask at Devil's Night, and to me that solves the problem. The episode proceeds to detail how Scum orchestrated some of their later Zodiac killings, and the life of Valerie Solanas, both before and after the attempted murder of Andy Warhol. These scenes take up quite a bit of runtime, and most of it's completely irrelevant to the plot that came before and after it in the season, so I'm not going to dwell on every little detail of these flashbacks, but I will say that it's highly dependent on Lena Dunham's performance, as she's given the bulk of the dialogue in each of her scenes, with several monologues. And this is completely subjective, but I'm not a big fan of Lena's performance in this role. Men, they need to be the agents of creation and chaos, and they will not stop until the whole world is in their grubby little hands. Back in the present day, BB convinces the female members of Kai's cult, Beverly, Winter, and Ivy, that they must strike against Kai and take control of the cult. Later, Kai confronts Winter after finding her copy of the Scum Manifesto, and inspired by Valerie, he tests out some acronyms of his own on Winter, like Fear is Truth and Men Lead, Women Bleed. Winter takes issue with that last one, and Kai claims it was Harrison's idea. Taking the bait, hook, line, and sinker, BB, Beverly, Ivy, and Winter then trick Harrison into meeting them at the butchery, where they finally show us some real butchery action. Unfortunately though, it's Harrison who is on the chopping board tonight. He claims he didn't come up with the acronym as Kai had claimed, but the girls are not convinced. Psh, Kai wouldn't manipulate us, he's such a nice guy. First on the scene, once again, Beverly Hope delivers a special report on the discovery of Harrison's body, and she also takes some on-air jabs at Kai Anderson's promises for law and order in the community, making her descent clear as day to Kai, who sits at home plotting with none other than B.B. Babbitt, proving that he is still pulling the strings. Roll credits. Lena Dunham aside, this episode really just kills the momentum from the last episode with honestly some completely irrelevant crap. Even when compared to other historical flashbacks in the season, this one takes up so much of the episode's runtime and it also takes the most creative liberties, and pretty much none of it is in service of the season's central story, even though BB is eventually revealed to be quite integral to the events of the season. While I love that Frances Conroy had a role in the season and she got to play such a visually striking villain, I wish we could have gotten more of her in the present day, obviously she does have some scenes in later episodes, but all in all, she is very underutilized. To keep it brief, in my opinion, the episode deserves its bad reputation, and it's got an annoyingly long title that feels like it's trying to tell me there's a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard. 
All right, now let's see if the season can pick up that momentum once again after the previous episode dropped the ball so severely. Episode 8 is titled Winter of Our Discontent in reference to the opening lines of Shakespeare's Richard III, and it begins with a reunion of brothers as Vincent visits a still-recovering Kai and congratulates him on his successful campaign and his survival of that assassination attempt. We then learn that Vincent actually didn't know anything about Kai's recent work building a cult from the ground up, but now that Vincent knows about it, he says that he wants in on all of it. It seems that the cult has turned the butchery on Maine into their own full-service cafeteria run by the women, despite, you know, Ali being the one paying for the lease. I mean, like, seriously, the restaurant lease is something the show brought up in the first place, but then it clearly forgets about it instantly, and the writers have been using it as a safe space for both Ali and Ivy, depending on who who needs it at the time. But one thing's for sure, the restaurant is not open for business and it's probably just putting Ali deeper and deeper into debt. We then are shown a city council meeting where Kai is proposing that his blue-shirted security team become a fully-fledged state-funded police force. A councilman by the name of Perry is the sole person opposing the proposition, so Kai threatens his family and the guy ends up voting in favor of Kai's new police force. That makes me uncomfortable. And even your two beautiful daughters have to leave those gates to go to school, don't they? Oh, yes. These new directives in Kai's agenda, plus the sudden rise of misogyny within the cult, drives Beverly to discuss a revolution against Kai with the ladies. Winter still believes in her brother, and she thinks that Kai is still on base with his original plan, and everything will eventually come to fruition. Because, you know, Kai's just a really nice guy. Beverly warns her, though, that Kai is only doing this for his own self-serving purposes, and he wouldn't hesitate to kill Winter if she stood in his way. Winter says that that no, actually, Kai would never kill her. In fact, Kai's even saved her life in the past. We then flash back to October of 2015, when back when Kai and Winter's favorite pastime was trolling on the dark web. They start with the easy targets, what they call the SJWs, before they shift their trolling energies onto a more radical evangelical crowd. And that's when things get real, as someone by the name of Pastor Charles invites them to his judgment house. This intrigues Kai, and the siblings accept the invitation. At the Judgment House, the Andersons meet Pastor Charles, played by Rick Springfield, and they quickly realize that this guy is about some truly dark shit. He has set up his house to function like an extremely advanced haunted house, with security cameras, automated movements like doors locking and curtains revealing, and the real fucked up part is that he's got his real victims trapped and forced to put on his show. For the sake of monetization, I can't show most of this, but if you're into, like, Saw or things like that, this is the most AHS has ever ventured into that territory, so definitely seek out this episode if that's your gig. In a rare sign of humanity, Kai helps Winter save one of Pastor Charles's victims, and he vows to save all of the victims trapped in the house, which he and Winter start to do, before Winter is caught by Charles, who says that he wants to include her in his show. Kai shows up though, and he knocks Charles out, and they then pull a classic Uno reverse card by putting Charles in one of his own killing traps, and collectively executing him. This whole segment at the Judgment House provides for some of the franchise's most disturbing moments, straight out of a Saw movie, and I'd go out on a limb and include Pastor Charles on a list with some of the most despicable villains in the show's history, which is crazy because this season really just introduces this guy, devotes an insane amount of production design work into his house of horrors, and then they just drop him and leave him in the past, never to be mentioned again. By the way, speaking of the amount of work that went into this house, here's a more detailed look at the set design of the Judgment House. This run-in with one of the AHS universe's most sadistic villains, though, played a crucial role in Kai's radicalization, as what he experienced in that house, according to Winter, caused him to develop an addiction to Adderall and go even deeper into the dark web. Heck, it's even what made him dye his hair blue. 
and perhaps it even opened his eyes to the power of a group of people who all share the same goal. Winter says that somewhere along the way, Kai lost his natural desire to help people though, like he helped Pastor Charles victims, and what he now desires is a destruction of the old world in order to build his own new world. Winter pleads to the girls that she can get Kai back on the right path, and Beverly allows Winter to give it a shot, but if she is unsuccessful, Beverly is moving full steam ahead with her revolution. So, Winter expresses some of the girls' frustrations to Kai, and he initiates a pinky-to-pinky -pinky meeting. During this meeting, Winter hesitates to give Kai her unconditional love and loyalty, and Kai breaks down and prepares to put Winter through the ultimate test of loyalty, as he proceeds to propose that the next steps of his movement include the creation of a messiah, which he says must occur through an incestuous threesome between himself, Winter, and Detective Colton Haynes. If you feel like that came out of the blue, you're right, it absolutely did. Then we catch up with Allie, as apparently she's back from a completely off-screen three-week vacation to the psych ward, where she is now furious at Dr. Vincent for sending her to. I have been coming to you for months, begging for your help, telling you exactly what's been going on. Dr. Vincent admits that for a majority of the two's visits regarding the cult, he didn't believe her. I find this to be a small plot hole though, because as soon as the clowns start tormenting Allie, she completely stops going to therapy, and all of their therapy sessions following this were completely against her will and set up by Ivy. So Allie's claim that Vincent has been ignoring her pleas for help against the clowns for quote-unquote months doesn't seem to be true in the slightest. Allie very clearly understood from episode 1 that her therapist who just wants to put her on pills that she hates is not the one that's going to save her from these clowns. Anyways, while Vincent didn't believe Allie in the past, he does now, and he reveals to Allie that not, not only is Kai his brother, but the woman who tore her family apart from the inside out, Winter, is Kai's sister. I kind of forgot that Allie didn't know that by now. Because Kai used Dr. Vincent's case files, Allie blames Vincent as the cause for her son being torn away from her, and Vincent promises to get Allie her life and Oz back by locking Kai up. Later, Kai begins to put Winter's loyalty to the test with his completely fucked messiah ritual with the detective. But since Detective Colton Haynes doesn't like girls, the plan is ruined, and Winter finally lets out her anger regarding this entire situation. The first time I watched this episode, I assumed that this whole threesome plan was just a test to see how devoted Winter is to the cause, and that even if Winter did exactly what he asked of her, Kai wouldn't go through with it, almost like he knew she wouldn't. But the actual scene seems to imply that Kai was going into the Messiah plan earnestly, and had Colton not run into some performance issues, I don't want to know what would have happened. And it's absolutely insane, even for Kai. It's still something that I don't think was necessary for in this season, it comes out of the blue, and makes Kai seem even more pathetic than he already seemed, and it's just weird all around. Later, Ali invites Kai over for dinner, and he and a couple of his blue-shirted besties come right on over. Ali prepares man-witches for the men, because she's not trying to pander at all. Ali then proposes a deal. She will give Kai what she believes is highly important information, and in return, Kai will ensure the safe return of Oz to Allie. The information Allie has is that Kai's brother, Vincent, is attempting to send Kai to prison, which fair enough, Vincent did just promise Allie six minutes ago, and Allie tells Kai that, You cured me. I'm not afraid of anything anymore. Did you get a new haircut or something? In the next scene, as punishment for her anger the other day, Kai is making Winter do anti-community service, spreading garbage all over the side of the road. Detective Colton Haynes then pays her a visit, we then learn how Detective Colton Haynes and Kai met in a flashback. Apparently, Kai used to distribute fake prescriptions using Vincent's name, and Colton Haynes caught him and blackmailed him into giving him 70% of Kai's proceeds in addition to some other, uh, favors. At Detective Colton Haynes' apartment, there's another slight nod to AHS Freak Show, as he's got a bottle of Freak Show wine, which is a real wine brand with no affiliation to the show, but the show including it in this scene 
scene is certainly a reference to the fourth season, which of course the season has already nodded to on a handful of occasions. Not only is the detective a wine aficionado, but he's also a neo-Nazi with a disturbingly large collection of memorabilia. Kai notices some of the detective's uh, sexual shortcomings, and he teaches him his true potential. And this is essentially how Colton Haynes got indoctrinated into Kai's cult by essentially targeting and exploiting the detective's own internalized homophobia. Then, back in the car with Winter and the detective, the detective tries to take advantage of Winter, but Winter grabs his gun, you son of a bitch, and she tries to get him to repeat one of Valerie Solanus's mantras. He refuses to say it, and Winter shoots him in the head. Then, as Kai continues his power trip, he holds a cult meeting to confront those who have betrayed him, his brother Vincent and his former co-leader Beverly Hope. Kai first confronts Vincent, and we learn that the pinky meetings actually originated between Kai and Vincent when they were kids. Then, in a brotherly spat, Kai cuts off Vincent's pinky before killing him, much to the disturbance of their sister Winter. Kai then turns to Beverly and reveals that Winter blamed Beverly for the death of the detective. Beverly denies this, but is enraged enough at the situation to completely read Kai for exactly what he is. Just another attention whore. Kai then sends her to the isolation chamber, wherever that is. The cult members then begin to unmask, and Kai welcomes a new clown to the cult, as the mask that once belonged to Beverly Hope now belongs to, drumroll, Ali Mayfair Richards. Overall, I think this episode really highlights the strengths and the weaknesses of this season. Episode 6 was really a turning point for the season, but because of episode 7, we aren't really feeling those effects until this episode. All of the actors are given a lot to work with in this episode, and one of the season's strengths is its performances. Another positive this episode has going for it is that it has its horror elements down to a T. This episode further drives the point that AHS does not need to be supernatural to be scary. In fact, it can even be scarier sometimes without it. But where this episode loses me, and also where episodes 6 and 7 lost me, is unfortunately its writing. Kai's goals completely shift overnight. The entire way his cult functions changes at the flip of a switch. Beverly and literally all of the women being sanctioned to kitchen duty, despite many of those women being founding members of the cult. This change with how the cult operates is so sudden that it kind of just feels like the writers were struggling to make feminism a strong theme in the season. So to solve this, they just simply made Kai incredibly misogynistic. At this point in the season, the cult also no longer commits those clown murders. So what exactly is the point of some of them still wearing the clown masks to the meetings? Especially when the majority of the cult is now wearing these blue shirts. With Meadow gone, I guess nobody else in the cult had any creative bone in their body to design more masks, or perhaps Kai is pushing for a more uniform look, but then again, why are the clowns still here at all? In the context of this season of American Horror Story, which hyped up the clowns in the marketing campaign so much and used them heavily in the first five episodes, it is disappointing that in this tail end of the season, this cult isn't even a clown cult anymore. It's just a cult where people wear blue shirts. Also, remember Twisty? Was that seriously all he was brought on the season to do? He got one comic book scene and a dream sequence. The Twisty comics could have been a really fun element for the season to explore, even if it's in the background. What else from the AHS universe has been turned into media in the modern day? And one last note on Kai, this episode scene with the attempted threesome really adds an entire new element to his character. Turns out he's actually not as calculated as he once seemed. In fact, he'll make something up on the spot and then run with it until it's done. This plan stands out as much more childish and outlandish than a lot of his earlier plans, which were less clearly stated plans and more a collection of buzzwords that practically confused all of his followers into going along with it. I don't know, the scene is obviously just weird weird on a lot of levels, and it makes Kai come off as just sort of impulsive and dumb, which I must say feels like a bit of a contradiction to the Kai that we met at the beginning of the season. Sure, he had a lot of the same stupid talking points that Donald Trump had, but to me that always seemed like a character he was putting on to try and attract a similar base as Donald Trump himself. Another issue with this episode is that Allie gets sent away to the psych ward for three weeks and we see none of it, and then she comes back as a completely cured badass who is ready to take down the cult from the inside out. This change in Ali's character is what the entire season has been building up to, and it is satisfying to see her take so much action in all of her scenes in the episode. The issue is for me that all of her characters
character development happened off screen at that hospital. Episodes 1 through 5 do such a good job at making Ali a believable character despite all of her eccentricities that when she starts to channel some of her fervor and anxiety into actually becoming a active and compelling character in episode 6, those changes in her character do feel natural in that episode given everything she's been told. So Ali's turn was clearly starting to naturally happen in episode 6, so if instead of giving us so many Valerie Solanas flashbacks in the last episode, episode 7 in instead showed us how those things developed while Ali was in that psych ward, or matter of fact we could scrap the whole Ali going to the psych ward thing altogether, and the season could have moved on at that incredibly high speed pace that episode 6 had, and we actually could have continued to see Ali's character develop in real time. Instead, Ali is completely benched in episode 7, she does not appear at all, and then of course she comes back in episode 8, guns a-blazing thanks to what must have been a pretty radical mental hospital. Episode 9, entitled Drink the Kool-Aid, is directed by none other than Angela Bassett. In what is her second directorial credit on AHS, after directing Chapter 6 from Roanoke, and this serves as the season's unofficial Halloween episode as it aired on Halloween night in 2017. Drink the Kool-Aid begins with another historical reenactment of a real-life cult, this time it's the Heaven's Gate cult, and its leader, Marshall Applewhite, is of course played by Evan Peters in what is now his third role in the season. The episode episode uses some real footage from the crime scene that is also dramatized, and despite Evan Peters' prosthetics in this scene making me laugh just a little bit, it's overall a very unsettling montage that depicts the real-life tragedy that occurred in 1997 in which Applewhite led 38 of his followers in a mass suicide. The cult flashbacks in this episode are pretty heavy, so let's lighten the mood a little bit by watching this time-lapse of Evan Peters' transformation into Applewhite. <laughs> In this montage, we also see Evan Peters' fourth role in this season, as he also plays cult leader David Koresh, who ultimately died in the 1993 Waco siege after allegations of serious abuse caused the federal government and local law enforcement to raid his compound, in a standoff that lasted 51 days. AHS proceeds to depict Koresh's murder of several of his followers in the final days of that siege, before he takes his own life. This montage is far from over though, as we then get Evan Peters' fifth role in the season, this time playing another historical cult leader, Jim Jones, who led 918 of his followers to commit suicide on November 18th, 1978. This, this unimaginable tragedy is what led to the existence of the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid, in which the episode, of course, is named after. So, what do all three of these cult leaders have in common? Well, actually a lot, but most prominently, they all ended up killing their followers in mass. Between these three historical flashbacks, which which are all narrated by Peters as Kai, in addition to him playing all of those leaders, we essentially start to realize that these historical figures are the ones that Kai is now pulling from instead of Donald Trump. Kai is a lot of things, but he's definitely not original. This sequences realism thanks to its blend of real-life, first-hand footage, photographs, and the show's reenactments of said events is extremely chilling, and I'd argue it's another one of the series most hard to watch, especially considering how the show pretty much adapts these three stories with few embellishments, whereas with other historical figures like Valerie Solanas a few episodes earlier or with Charles Manson in the next episode, the show takes a lot more blatant creative liberties. The tonal inconsistencies between all of these flashbacks in the tail end of the season are definitely odd, and I wish the show would have just committed to one approach to these flashbacks, if they even had to include them at all. In an interview with The Wrap, Evan Peters shed some light on how challenging his various roles were in the season, especially especially considering how they were all thrust upon him relatively last minute. <laughs> it, it, like, it was just exhausting. It was mentally and physically exhausting. I, I remember I, Ryan told me I was going to be doing Andy Warhol, and that was like a few weeks before we were going to actually shoot it. I was panicked. Like, okay, I have to watch everything. I have to listen to everything. I have to figure out how he moves, how he talks, how he walks, like what he was going through. And I didn't know that much about Andy Warhol. I'd seen Shop Girl, but I hadn't quite... <laughs> dove into his world and there's some amazing stuff on YouTube like documentaries and audio clips and stuff so I dove in head first with that and uh, 
I love that. And then, and then they saw it and they saw the dailies and they were like, oh, okay, cool. Now we want, now we want you to play uh, Manson. Would, could you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, maybe. So I kind of just did the same thing. And then they said, okay, now we want you to play the Heaven's Gate Cult leader. We want to play James Jones, Jim Jones, David Koresh. And I, again, was panicked and freaking out, but uh, just did that same, you know, YouTube wormhole and documentary and read books uh, on Jonestown and uh, yeah it was it was kind of awesome and, and, and fun to do and I learned a lot and uh, and I learned about a lot about myself as well and sort of uh, you know you see it and it's yeah. like 30 seconds yeah. but, but it was like you know months of, of trying to figure out how I was gonna do it mm -hmm. so it was uh, yeah it was a little weird. Anyways, after those three flashbacks, we cut to Kai in his basement with some of his followers as he wraps up the narration from before, where he is clearly idolizing those three atrocious men. Kai then warns his followers that the cult is about to seriously level up, and then he adjourns the meeting with that ominous cliffhanger. The next day, Kai throws another tantrum after Councilman Perry opposes his next proposal. This time it's a citywide ban on certain websites that Kai deems as offensive. Another councilman, Councilman Moyer, who appears to have been freshly beaten up, thinks that this website ban is a great idea and it, and it doesn't appear forced at all. The motion passes and Kai then reveals how exactly he's about to level up by announcing his run for Senate in 2018. Councilman Perry warns though that he's going to have a hard time defeating the incumbent, Senator Herbert Jackson. Ali and Ivy officially reunite for the first time to unpack all that has occurred over the last couple of episodes and Ivy expresses remorse for some of her actions, but Ali doesn't give a and she reiterates that all she wants is her son. Just then, Winter walks in with Oz, and Allie professes that she will never leave him again. And she gives him a new Twisty comic book in what is officially Twisty's final appearance in Cult. This comic book cover, though, has got to be my favorite as it features some new cameos from additional freak show characters, Pepper, Jimmy, and Meat. This gift is Allie attempting to prove to Oz that she is truly stronger than she once was, and she can be a stable mother to him. And at least for now, it appears to be working. Winter also takes this chance to apologize to Allie as well, and blames her actions all on those well-known post-election jitters. And she confesses that she no longer believes that Kai would protect her at all costs after she just witnessed Kai killed their brother, Vincent. So, Winter proposes that the four of them escape the cult together. And in a rare moment of humor since the departure of the Wiltons, Winter hands the ladies a printed out WikiHow article on how to escape a cult. I found this on Wiki. How to escape from a cult. They lay out 14 steps, it's all in there. Ali agrees to the plan, but just as they begin to take action, they are visited by some of the blue shirts, who forcibly invite them to an emergency cult meeting. Once they arrive at Kai's basement, he lets Beverly out of the isolation chamber, and Kai sits his four betrayers down on the couch, Ali, Ivy, Winter, and Beverly, and he presents them with an ominous sugary beverage. But surprise surprise, Kai then presents all of his other followers with the same drink. A blue shirt by the name of Puss Bucket refuses to drink the Kool-Aid and professes that he's out of the cult altogether. So Kai instructs Gary to kill our dearly beloved Puss Bucket. After witnessing a live execution, everyone else of course drinks Kai's jungle juice before he reveals to them that this was all a loyalty test and there is no poison in the Kool-Aid because duh, he just announced his Senate campaign. They've got work to do. After that traumatic experience, the Mayfair Richards prepare to execute their runaway plan without Winter or Beverly. However, this plan is quickly foiled as when they arrive to pick up Oz from school, they are told that he has already been picked up by his nanny. Meanwhile, in Kai's basement, Kai initiates a pinky-to-pinky -pinky meeting with Oz, which somehow ends with him being offered the not-poisoned Kool-Aid. Ali and Ivy burst in on this, and Oz reveals that within this short time frame, Kai has convinced Oz that he is his real father. Kai claims to keep track of all of his babies that were conceived throughout his time donating at the sperm bank. Ali and Ivy, though, are highly skeptical. Cornered, Ali and 
Ivy are forced to agree to Oz spending the night at Kai's. In their first moments alone since all of the recent madness, Allie finishes preparing a lovely pasta dish paired with a classy glass of red wine for Ivy as Ivy goes through some old paperwork, unsuccessfully debunking the possibility that Kai could be Oz's father. Allie says though that it doesn't really matter if he is or isn't the father, as long as Kai believes that Oz is his son, Kai will not harm him. Ivy then says that the only way to get Oz back is murder, and Allie's like, exactly. In a stark contrast to their dynamics at the beginning of the season, in this scene, Ivy is nervous, jittery, and paranoid while Ali is as solid as a rock. Ivy begins to chow down on the pasta before Ali even makes herself a plate, and Ali then begins the entertainment portion of this dinner and a show she's prepared for Ivy as she sets off on a monologue detailing what we missed out on during those three weeks in the mental hospital, how Ali's dark thoughts evolved into a battle against her own phobias driven by her own want to seek out revenge on Ivy for intentionally driving her crazy so that Ali could never have custody of Oz. If anything makes up for the missteps of episode 7 and making Ali not present in that episode at all, it is this scene which does enough to fill in the blanks of Ali's character development during those three weeks, albeit it's still a little too little too late. But Sarah Paulson gets to act her ass off in this episode, which is always a pleasure to witness, and this scene may be my favorite of the entire season. It culminates with Ali revealing that she poisoned both the pasta and the wine, and Ivy begins to bleed from the mouth as Ali sits and watches with a smile on her face as her former wife takes her final breaths. It's a visceral scene that pays off all of the torment and gaslighting that Ali suffered through in the first six episodes, and it's a stripped down scene that is made strong by the incredible performances of Sarah Paulson and Allison Pill, as well as first time episode writer Adam Penn, who wrote an incredibly compelling and dramatic death scene that, dare I say, is even more satisfying than the finale. To give his own thoughts on this climactic moment in the season, please welcome another special guest, EJ Moreno. Hello American Horror Story historians, my name is EJ and what an awesome video this is. Look, if you know my channel, I've always been a bit hard on Colt, but this season has at least one thing I love and that is an awesome revenge plot. We know Allie was a an interesting character. Allie Mayfield Richards was a girl that we all were frustrated with, a Sarah Paulson character that gave us some hair pulling moments. Man, we wanted her to get better and find her revenge and by the end of the season she definitely gets that when she finds out that her wife Ivy was part of the cult and she gets that revenge she like finally gets that Kill Bill hit list and Ivy is seemingly at the top of the list now I felt for Allie this entire season she's basically getting manipulated and you know black like a, what was it gaslit by everyone around her it's a hard-hitting subject it's a hard-hitting season and I think Sarah Paulson plays this well but what really made this like the most iconic moment for me out of this entire season is that surprise angle to it we knew that Allie was locked up you know she wasn't able to have her wife visit she wasn't able to see her son so that kind of drove her a little bit mad once she finds out that Ivy was involved with the cult holding her family from her while she was in like the loony bin my goodness she has a lot of things she needs to get like taken care of and one of that is again killing that wife my goodness what an amazing scene this was building up to we had the dinner scene where you know we have the spaghetti the red wine and you're like oh boy what is this leading to you notice Allie is not eating the food curious curious and you know miss allison pill who's playing ivy is just munching away kind of talking trash kind of knowing or thinking at least that she has the upper hand and i love this moment where ally basically says i've been cured of my fears and i have filled that hole in my heart in my body with revenge I'm going to kill you. And, you know, Ivy's so cocky. She starts choking. She starts spitting up. She's on that floor dying. And it's just the Sarah Paulson acting here. We know Sarah Paulson can slay a scene. But something about this scene in particular was one of my favorite moments of her. She just is so evil, but like justifiably evil. Like you understand why she's doing what she's doing. And it's just so amazing to watch. Colt is jam packed with amazing things. I like the uprising of Kai. I think he's a frustrating and scary character, but Evan Peters plays it amazingly well. I like the introduction of Billy Lord to the entire 
entire AHS universe. There's so much in this one season that is just so fun to dive into, but this death, this scene, it just lives on in my head forever. You could get rid of so many moments from like all of American Horror Story, but if I had to keep five moments, I would keep Allie's revenge. It's just iconic. It's just what we wanted. It to for me save the entire season. If I did not get the Alley Revenge tour and it's starting with this amazing moment, I think Colt would have been a complete bust. But as I've grown and grown to appreciate Colt a little bit more, I have to say this moment is just so deliciously crazy, so deliciously dark, and exactly from what what we want from American Horror Story, this moment is why we watch this show and why we're doing this celebration, this anniversary video. Now, let's get back to the regular video. Thank you so much for joining me. It has been a blast talking about Colt and this one specific iconic scene with you all today. Thanks again to EJ for contributing his thoughts to this video. EJ is another content creator and Critics' Choice member with a ton of videos on AHS, horror movies, and so much more on both his personal channel as well as over on Flickering Myth. So definitely check out all of his stuff as well. But back Back to the episode, we are then given, against our will, an epilogue to the previous Jim Jones flashback, where we meet Evan Peters' sixth character in Cult, none other than the cult leader of them all, Jesus Christ. And it was all jokes. No, but it ain't about joke, because if it was about joke, you would have said, like, ha ha, JK. But it the thing was about, a joke. No, but you didn't say JK, though. But the scene obviously takes some of those creative liberties I was talking about earlier, featuring Jesus being suspended in the air on ropes, as if in a school play, before he resurrects Jim Jones who then proceeds to resurrect the rest of his followers in the scene. The flashbacks in this episode all take place inside of Kai's mind as he is telling these stories to his followers, and this scene further signifies that Kai is completely losing it. Cut to the present day, where Kai is telling this made-up epilogue to his gullible followers, only Oz calls bullshit as he's pulled up Jim Jones' Wikipedia page, and Kai destroys Oz's phone in a fit of rage. Later, Ali visits the sperm bank and bribes the receptionist to reveal to her the identity of Oz's dad, and guess what? Kai is not the father. With that information noted, Ali's got another trick up her sleeve. In the next scene, Ali invites Kai over for another round of manwitches, where she informs Kai about Ivy's death, and she presents Kai with a doctored document which falsely confirms Kai's claims to Oz's parenthood. Ali uses this to convince Kai that she now believes that this is all a part of some cosmic plan to bring Oz Oz's true family together, and this causes Kai to realize that Oz must be the messiah. With this new bond, Kai helps Ali dispose of Ivy's body by dumping her in his parents' mausoleum, which is also where Vincent ended up, and after that, the episode ends with this fabricated family embracing in a group hug. Here's the thing, you know I don't love when Ryan Murphy or AHS plays around with real life murderers or their victims. More often than not, it just feels like it's done in poor taste. And while I do think the flashbacks in this episode are handled more tastefully than a lot of similar scenes in other seasons or even the one that happens in the next episode, I can't help but to think that this element of the season could have been scrapped entirely in favor of giving proper character arcs to characters like Ali, Kai, Beverly, Winter, or Ivy. That being said, Ivy's death scene in this episode is one of the best performed and well edited scenes in the entire history of the show, in addition to being one of the season's most satisfying moments, signifying a dark turn in Allie's character. Episode 10, entitled Charles Manson in Charge, begins with a flashback to October 19th, 2016, which happened to be the day of the final debate of the 2016 presidential election. At the Anderson basement, Winter is having a viewing party with a couple of her friends who are like-minded politically, and thus the three of them laugh at the performance of the Republican candidate. Candidate. Kai, who is also in the room, sparks a debate with them, warning that Hillary Clinton would not be a strong enough candidate to carry out the quote-unquote blue wave that many believe might happen in 2016, with the hope that states like Arizona or Texas might flip from being historically red to blue states in 2016, which of course did not happen in that election. Kai tells them that he believes Trump supporters are more passionate and Hillary supporters are not, and the results will reflect this passion. The debate gets even more heated, and Kai slaps one of Winter's friends in the face. 
This season's got a lot of slapping, doesn't it? This slap, however, in the context of the entire season, turned out to be quite integral to the plot of this season, as we'll see later on. Believe it or not though, aside from the violence in this scene, it also features a little bit of a Scream Queens reunion, as one of Winter's friends is played by actress Kathy Marks, who previously appeared in Scream Queens Season 2 as Chanel Number 11, the one with 11 fingers, of course. I really cannot wait to break down that season one day. Winter's friend assures that she will be pressing charges, and those charges do manifest two weeks later when Kai is ordered to take therapy for his anger issues. As this December 2016 flashback continues, Kai's therapist turns out to be none other than Bibi Babbitt, and we learn that she introduced Kai to the work of Valerie Solanas in December of 2016, and she was the one who planted the seed in Kai's head that he could change the world if he pursued politics. Bibi then makes Kai repeat the scum turd mantra, which he does. I am a turd. A lowly abject turd. I'm a turd. A lowly abject turd. This reveal that Bibi is the true source of Kai's own radicalization, and that he's doing all of this in service of her, theoretically, definitely does detract from Kai as a character. Maybe it's partially because I'm not a big fan of the Valerie Solanas episode, but the fact that Valerie and Bibi are actually turning out to have dramatic implications on the season in what is the penultimate episode, it feels like a bit of a letdown, because I would much rather this season end strongly with the characters that we know in the present day, finishing all the conflicts that they have already started. But instead, with only two episodes left, we are revealing that something we thought we knew all along about the main antagonist, that he started this movement from the ground up himself, is actually not true at all, and Bibi has truly been somewhat of a puppet master. I can't help but to think that this season would have been a lot stronger if it remained a more locked-in character study of specifically Kai and Ali well into the season's second half, rather than the show getting consistently sidetracked with excessive backstory. Anyways, in one of his first rallies, for his Senate campaign, Kai Anderson seems to have evolved his campaign strategy since last time, merging many of Donald Trump's messages with the impassioned delivery of those maniacal cult leaders, and during this rally, Kai spots a white van and tells Speedwagon how he believes that the feds are spying on him. Then, in a nice bit of retribution from Kai's own actions all the way back in episode 1, a protester throws a bottle of piss at Kai before another protester pepper sprays Kai directly in the face. <laughs> Kai then gathers all of his followers to surround him as he retells the story of August 8, 1969, which was the night the Manson family brutally murdered five people, including actress Sharon Tate. As Kai tells his boys this true crime tale like it's some sort of bedtime story, the show proceeds to give us another full-fledged flashback scene depicting the events of that night. It's stylized in an even different way than both the grimy yet comedic Valerie Solanas flashbacks or the more grounded, found footage-based flashbacks from Drink the Kool-Aid. Instead, this Charles Manson flashback opts for much campier performances and stylized visuals with similarly disturbing depictions of violence based on true events. In the flashback, the member of the Manson family are played by some of the season's primary ensemble. Evan Peters gets his seventh role in the series playing Charles Manson himself. Sarah Paulson gets her second role in the season playing Susan Atkins, a member of the Manson family. Billy Eichner returns for his second role playing Tex Watson. Leslie Grossman also in her second role plays Patricia Krenwinkel. And Billy Lord plays her second role as Linda Kasavian, all of whom were members of the Manson family involved in these murders. I won't get into too much of the contents of this scene, because beyond getting to see the actors play new roles, it's really just an overly dramatic recreation of a real crime that, because of this scene's excessive over-the-top performances, just rubs me the wrong way. Then, inspired by Charles Manson's alleged plans to incite a race war by blaming the crimes of his own cult on innocent black men, Kai proposes a quote-unquote night of a thousand Tates, in reference to Sharon Tate, who was pregnant at the time of her murder. Basically, Kai is proposing that the cult go out and kill 1,000 pregnant women not where you thought the season would end up, is it? Then, Gary, Speedwagon, and a couple other blue shirts arrive at Planned Parenthood, where they intend on stealing files of women on the waiting list to receive abortions. 
as that is how the cult would find its targets for Kai's big night. They travel there in Gary's truck, which still has the grocery store logo on it. I'm sure Fields Market loves to be associated with this. This turns out to be a trap though, as Kai has turned on Gary for no clear reason, and lucky for us, Kai is still using the clown masks when handling internal affairs, so we do get one last appearance of those fantastic costumes that ended up being so underused in this second half of the season. Collectively, the clowns kill Gary, and then they display his body outside of the building, feeling guilty for framing Beverly Hope for Colton Haynes' murder, which of course led to her being put in solitary confinement. Winter offers Beverly a train ticket for her to escape the cult. Suspecting that this is a trap though, Beverly refuses to accept the ticket, and vows that she will remain loyal to the cause. Meanwhile, Kai frantically searches for a bug he suspects that the feds planted in his house, before retreating to the upstairs mausoleum, where his mental state continues to deteriorate, first hallucinating Vincent's corpse coming to life, before Vincent is killed again by none other than a hallucination of Charles Manson. Oddly enough, as Charles himself states in this scene, the real-life Charles Manson was still alive at the time this episode was filming, and by the time it aired too. However, the statement would only be true for 12 more days, as, as this episode aired on November 7th, 2017, and the real Charles Manson would pass away on November 19th, 2017, after spending nearly the last five decades of his life in prison. With the help of his Manson hallucination, Kai's paranoia grows even more, and as he soon finds out, he may have actually been right about his house being tapped, as Ali tells him she may have found the bug. Just then, BB Babbitt arrives and gives us another bitch slap for our collection, before scolding Kai for failing to uphold the legacy of Valerie Solanus and Scum, although almost none of the cult's activities have been aligned with the Scum Manifesto, so it doesn't seem that BB ever really was controlling the cult's actions, even though she claims she was. And that's kind of what Kai begins to tell her, that he actually wasn't trying to create a contemporary chapter of Scum, but instead he's just using similar strategies of harnessing the fear of the public, but it's for his own gain as a world leader instead of Valerie's more radical feminist goals. BB is shocked to hear this, despite her entire existence being an afterthought this whole season. Like, where was BB when Kai woke up one day and formed a militia of only men, and that same day he forced all of the women of the cult to only work in the kitchen? This has been the status quo here for quite some time, and BB's just been dilly-dallying in the shadows, despite being pitched to us as the cult's true mastermind at the start of this very episode. BB then pulls a gun on Kai after he reveals this betrayal, but but before she pulls the trigger, she is promptly shot in the head by Allie. R.I.P. BB, you kind of sucked as a character, but Francis Conroy made you easily the best thing to come out of that Valerie episode, and your wig is iconic. Kai marks an end of an era as his blue hair is shaved off by Winter in favor of a buzz cut. Throughout this process, the Anderson siblings have a conversation about how Winter is slipping away because of how much Kai has changed lately. Kai then pulls out the bus ticket that Winter had bought for Beverly. I guess maybe Beverly turned Winter in as revenge. Just then, Winter is taken away by some of the Blue Man group. I guess Beverly's not the only one who wanted some revenge on Winter though, as Ali is now pushing a theory that Winter is the most that Kai is so paranoid about. Taking the bait and assuming this is true, Kai interrogates Winter as his new imaginary friend, Charles Manson, coaches him through what comes next. Kai begs Winter to confess her wrongdoings, and when she doesn't, Kai chokes her to death as he sobs in a painfully long and disturbing scene. Winter's death is shocking, and both Evan and Billy are giving extremely emotional performances. In that same interview with The Rap, Evan Peters expressed how this very scene, and also the entire season really pushed his limits as a performer and also taught him a lot about his limits when it comes to balancing his work and his personal life. It's rough watching that because it was, it, like I said, it was like the end of the season and it was just complete exhaustion and, and mental breakdown. Like, I learned a lot from this season and yeah. that I shouldn't, I basically went too like almost as similar to what Kai was doing, which was just, you know, he has this goal of world dominance. Right. And I'm like, well, <clears throat> you know, I really want, you know, to do a great job for this character and for this season. And it was a current season and I wanted it to, uh, you know, I really cared about it. I was really proud of the season in this role. So I wanted to do a great job, but I also was completely neglecting my family and friends and you know, my fiance. And it was just really, 
in a way, I felt like I was killing my own family, and it's not that way, yeah. obviously, but it was uh, <clears throat> dark. It's a crazy parallel to see, like, that's me actually yeah. losing it in a weird way. Didn't realize I was, uh, <laughs> needed so much therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Intense yeah, I loved working with Billy. She was, yeah, she jokes around a lot too. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was fun to work with her, especially that weird, uh, threesome scene that we had. Yep. My sister, uh, <laughs> what is going on in this you show? Don't have we don't this have that clip, thankfully. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it was just funny, you know? Like a lot of the stuff that we were doing, except for that, was, uh, was funny and, yeah. and fun to do. Then, surprise, surprise, in one final scene of this episode, we follow Speedwagon as he nervously walks to his car. Inside, he takes off his microphone, revealing that he actually is the mole, but clearly this whole double agent thing is getting to him as he smashes his mic pack against the dashboard, before none other than Ali opens his passenger door and takes a seat, to be continued. While the second half of the season definitely has some very strong moments, the episodes still seem a little bit disappointing given the season's true potential. The Valerie Solanus episode is still weighing down the second half of the season with its implications, and as much as I love Frances Conroy's performance by introducing her as the true source of Kai's radicalization, only to show her never actually having any tangible control over his cult's actions. It kind of feels like a last-ditch attempt at adding an interesting character into the season, only to have them hold no actual weight and get thrown out with a sudden death scene. Ali too feels like an afterthought in these episodes post-episode 6, as she takes a backseat to Kai and all of those historical flashbacks, even though comparatively Ali is a more reliable reliable narrator at this point in the season, and to me, her character has a much more interesting battle ahead of her, with her agenda being to regain custody of her child while also taking down this cult. And I just wish she was given even half of the focus that Kai gets in these episodes. Alright, it is now time to break down the final episode of Cult, but we've also got some other things to talk about afterwards, so make sure you stay tuned after the recap. Episode 11 is titled Great Again, and it begins in 2018 a decent amount of time after the events of the last episode, where Kai Anderson is being held in a maximum security prison, and he's on pinky-to-pinky -pinky basis with one of the guards named Gloria. Later, Kai gets beaten up by a fellow prisoner, and we then see that Kai has already formed a bit of a cult while inside this prison, as one of his followers saves him from his attacker. Kai, who is still hallucinating Charles Manson, kills the guy who saved him so that there will be no loose ends as Kai is about to pull off an escape plan. After meeting some of Kai's other new cult members, we get a flashback showing us how exactly he ended up serving this time. The flashback puts us around the time the last episode left off, where Kai proceeds to lead a cult meeting where he scales back his admittedly ambitious Night of a Thousand Tates plan. A little bad news to start. Turns out finding a thousand pregnant women to murder, super hard. Instead, he attends to pull off a night of 100 Tates, with the intention that this will stir up so much female rage that voters will turn to him rather than the incumbent, Senator Jackson. We then get our last title sequence of the season, so what the heck, let's finally break that sucker down. Firstly, Mac Quayle's reworking of the theme song in this season to incorporate more horns and cymbals to emulate the national anthem is my favorite version of the theme song, and I love when the seasons alter the theme song to fit the season itself, like what happens in Cult, Hotel, and 1984, and I love all of those renditions as well, but Cult takes the cake for me. I love Matt Quayle's work on this season overall as well, because the instruments used in the theme song are carried through throughout the score of the season, which really gives the season a distinct sonic style that I really love. If you go to Matt Quayle's YouTube channel, he has a bunch of the songs he composed for this season, as well as some of the other seasons, and it's definitely worth checking out. But now, let's break down the visuals of that title sequence. While some seasons are very cryptic with their title sequence clues, cults are actually all very obvious. None of them are super spoilery. The bees are both in reference to Harrison's bees and how Kai attempts to operate a hive mind within his cult. The American flags, the Trump and Clinton masks, George Washington, all of these clearly represent the season's political elements. There's a lot of clown and theme park imagery, which of course tie in with the clown cult, in addition to being one of Ali's fears, just like these 
holes, which are featured in the sequence as well. The shot of a butcher is probably a reference to the butchery on Main, which is owned by Ali and Ivy, and it could also be a small nod to the butcher from the previous season played by Kathy Bates. The gas bombs are likely a reference to the gas trucks that were a thing for a couple of the early episodes. The dead dog could either be referencing one of two animal deaths in the season, either the birds or Mr. Guinea, and of course we all know what the pinkies mean. While there may not have been very mind-blowing clues in this year's title sequence, I do really like the extremely green color scheme. Maybe we could have brightened it up a little bit, but overall the visuals are strong, but definitely not the best that we've seen from AHS title sequences. Here's some concept art for the season's title sequence which features a couple shots that did not make a cut, including a more blatant reference to Mr. Guinea, among others. We then catch up with Beverly Hope in this flashback where she breaks down, admitting that she doesn't want to do any of this anymore and she wants Allie to kill her out of mercy. In what I believe is a slight easter egg within this incredibly intense moment, Beverly Hope says, quote, I wanted to be the last person alive. I wanted to be the last person alive, but I just want to die which to me has got to be a nod to Adina Porter's previous role in AHS Roanoke, Lee Harris, who in the finale ended up being the sole survivor of that season, after lots of teasing on which character it would end up being. Ali refuses to kill Beverly though, warning that she won't want to miss what's going to happen next, in a vaguely creepy set of statements that make it seem like she may be actually drinking Kai's Kool-Aid. Kai's paranoia from the last episode continues in this flashback as he grows increasingly panicked the longer he can't get a hold of Speedwagon. So to calm him down, Ali reveals the truth about what happened to Speedwagon. We then get a flashback within this flashback, continuing the final scene of the previous episode which left off on the cliffhanger with Ali getting in Speedwagon's car. Speedwagon reveals to Ali that a while ago he was busted for drug possession and the cops used him to get dirt on Detective Colton Haynes. Without knowing all of the murder activities of the cult, and ever since they discovered the cult, he's been gathering information for the local authorities. Ali then kills Speedwagon with fervor in her eyes, a similar fervor that was in Susan Atkins' eyes, in what I believe to be a specific performance choice by Sarah Paulson and this episode's director Jennifer Lynch to call back to that scene from the previous episode revealing how even Ali actually has qualities to her that are strikingly similar to Kai Anderson himself. Ali then tells Kai that this means Winter was framed, and Kai breaks down over his wrongful execution of his sister. Ali then mothers Kai and gives him a pep talk, ensuring that he will follow through with his plan to execute the Knight of 100 Tates the next night. That next night, Kai intends to do just that. However, as he is ensuring that his followers have their necessary supplies, Ali runs off outside where she approaches some FBI vans and instructs them to raid Kai's property. During the ensuing raid, several of Kai's blue shirts lose their lives, but of course, Kai, Ali, and Beverly all survive, and it's clear that Kai is holding a grudge. We then flash forward back to 2018 where Ali runs the butchery all by herself, which is much busier than it's ever been, so hopefully that means Ali's made back some of her money that she lost. Beverly Hope stops by and the two old friends catch up. We then get slapped in the face with yet another reveal about the time that Ali spent in the mental hospital, as that was actually when the FBI first came into contact with Ali, as apparently the assassination attempt on Kai put him on their radar. I don't love that at the very last minute we are learning that the character who showed the strongest development throughout the season didn't actually change because of her need for revenge and the custody of her son, but she was actually working with the FBI the entire time, and that's the true reason why she joined the cult. And what did the FBI think about her little side quest where she murdered Ivy? Well, it doesn't matter, I guess, because according to Allie, the FBI gave her immunity. Speaking of Ivy, Allie gives Beverly some bullshit story about how Kai killed Ivy, but Beverly notes that Ivy's murder is the only one that Kai does not take credit for. In fact, Kai told the New York Times exactly who killed Ivy and why she did it, but Allie continues to deny this. Allie's new girlfriend, Erica, then approaches the table and Allie introduces Beverly to her, while also so informing her of her new outlook on life. Dating again, I'm impressed. Yeah, I know, I'm supposed to be a nice little girl in mourning for the rest of her life. Well, fuck that. I'm living. 
Later at Oz's birthday party, Erica takes a call from journalist Rachel Maddow's team, who Allie has apparently already turned down for interviews twice before. Erica thinks Allie should reconsider, but Beverly says, If she turned down Lana Winters, why would she talk to Rachel fucking Maddow? Thank you. And besides, <laughs> all I'm trying to do is put this behind me. In case you don't know, Lana Winters was the character Sarah Paulson played in season two, Asylum, as well as in a cameo in season six, Roanoke. So this is another instance of this season's blink and you'll miss it easter eggs. Back to that birthday party, Ali assures her confidants that she just wants to put the whole ordeal behind her and she doesn't want to do any press. She just wants to be a soccer mom. But the phone rings again, this time Ali answers it, and it's a collect call from Kai, who is now even more pissed at her after he's discovered that he is not the true father of Oz. Now that that's getting brought up again, if the FBI was behind Ali's movements in the past few episodes, why couldn't they both confirm Oz's father's true identity for Ali and forge the fake documents for her instead of Ali doing all of that on her own? Anyways, sometime later, Allie gives an unprecedented press conference, and she does a complete 180 on her earlier statement, as instead of being a soccer mom, she's now announcing her intention to run for Senate. In fact, it's the very seat that Kai had his eyes on. Once this mode is activated in Ali, I guess there's no turning back, as she then proceeds to serve full politician in a campaign ad where she vows to tear down the two-party system as senator. Beverly's now working on Ali's campaign, and she does seem to be doing okay for once. Good for her, but I do wish we could have gotten more insight on how exactly Beverly recovered from all that she's been through. But hey, at least she's made it here to the last episode and not, I don't know, murdered in the third episode like Chief Burleson. We then catch back up with Kai as he initiates his prison escape, which involves faking his own death with a body double and then just waltzing right out of the front gates disguised as a guard with Gloria. Mission accomplished. Ali learns of the news of Kai's death right before she is set to go on stage and debate Senator Jackson. Visually, this stage is reminiscent of the second 2016 presidential debate and Ali also hits a Lot of similar talking points that Hillary Clinton made, and her delivery and choice of pantsuit all seem to be evoking the former Secretary of State, much like how Kai evoked Donald Trump very much in his respective campaigns earlier on in the season. An audience member approaches the mic to ask a question, and he wastes no time to reveal himself as none other than Kai Anderson. Wow, he couldn't even let his fake death sit for more than 20 minutes before publicly revealing he's actually alive. Kai's blue shirts then block the door and threaten the crowd with their firearms as Kai proceeds to approach the stage. Once he's on stage, Kai knocks out Senator Jackson, points a gun at Ali, and he rambles maniacally about how women can't win elections and how they really just belong in the kitchen, proving that the more and more screen time you give Kai, the less and less he actually seems like a calculated villain. This guy's just deranged and delusional as shit. Kai pulls the trigger, but alas, the gun is empty. We then get another flashback, revealing that Gloria, the guard who helped Kai escape, was actually approached by Ali somewhat recently and convinced her to turn on Kai and sabotage his plan from then on out. Ali then delivers her final line to Kai, itself another reference to a famous Trump quote later utilized by Hillary herself. There is something more dangerous in this world than a humiliated man. A nasty woman. Beverly Hope is the one to deliver the final blow to Kai Anderson, a bullet to the head. Kai's blue shirts watch silently as their divine ruler lie dead on the floor, while Ali and Beverly rejoice with smirks of girl bossery. Is anyone gonna help Senator Jackson? So that earlier line where Beverly is at her lowest, asking to be killed, pays off in a really nice way, subverting the expectation that Beverly would not make it out of the finale, while also making her the one that takes the fatal shot at Kai Anderson, which leaves Ali in an even more powerful political position with no blood on her hands, which is unlike her very similar AHS final girl, Lana Winters, whose legacy was shown to bear the stain of her choice to kill the second bloody face. To put it simply. In the next scene of the finale, Ali wins the Senate race and then tucks Oz into bed with a promise for a better world now that she's won power. She then tells Oz that she's off to a meeting with some very powerful friends that will aid her in making that better world a reality. And in the final shot of the season, Ali adorns herself with the green velvet cloak worn by the members of Valerie Solanus's cult, Scum, stares at herself for a few seconds, and then she gets up as the show cuts to black. 
All right, so I'm going to talk some more about that ending in just a moment, but first let me give you my general thoughts on the finale. Much like the season that came before it, the finale is violent, it's abrasive, and it hits you over the head with its message. But surprisingly, when all is said and done, it does leave just the right amount up to the viewer's interpretation. The episodes leading up to it did not set up the finale to be anything but fast-paced, as the episode rushes to get everything wrapped up, and that rush is felt, but it's the performances of Evan Peters and Sarah Paulson that are able to drive the drama to its climactic final moment. While the episode leaves character development behind in favor of shock value and set pieces, the resulting episode is a tense political thriller that is certainly a hard finale to forget. All right, now back to that open ending. Here's what Sarah Paulson had to say about it in an interview with Entertainment Weekly. She said, well, it's the green cloak of the scum. It's the scum cloak. Listen, this is a conversation that Ryan and Tim Minear and I really had. At the end of the day, she's the mother of a son. She has a boy she's raising. There's a kind of poignant moment where he says, am I going to be a good person? Am I going to be a good man? And I say, I hope so. And their intent with writing it, and my intent with playing it was, I hope you will, because my mission in life is now to create a world where men have to be responsible for themselves and their behavior. I'm going to be in Washington and have some power, and the goal being nobody is going to get away with anything anymore. More than a good person, you have to be a feminist. You have to be on the right side of history. It should have had a feeling of something odd in my communication to him but it should be a mystery. But if you happen to be an online AHS fan at the time of Colt's airing, you may know there is much deeper lore and rumors about this final shot. And today I'm going to attempt to determine if that infamous rumor about an alternate ending to Colt is true or false. But before I let you in on all the things that were alleged to happen in a alternate ending, I must first introduce you to the lost world of AHS insiders. I'd say from around season 6 to season 10, there was a phenomenon of a bunch of private Twitter accounts popping up claiming to have inside information on the production of AHS. For the most part, it was pretty easy to determine which of these insiders were fakers, but every once in a while, one of these insiders would fully convince fans that they were 100% legit, so much so that fans would then fight skeptics in the replies on the insider's behalf. And from my experience, there were only ever a handful that seemed to be at least somewhat legit. One of those reliable insiders went by the name of AHS7 Insider, and they are the culprit for some of the largest rumors surrounding AHS cult, including the one about this alternate ending. Part of what I wanted to accomplish with this video was get to the bottom of this rumor once and for all because I've seen it stated as fact on a couple of different occasions when even if I may have believed it at a certain time, I don't think it's ever wise to trust any of these insiders information as being accurate as we are about to see. Full disclosure, I have looked at all of AHS7 insiders tweets about cult. I'm sure they've deleted things over the years, however, what they still have on their page is a lot of things that turned out to be false, as well as some things that did turn out to be true. But by far, one of the wildest rumors that this account spread was this alternate ending to Cult that, according to AHS7 Insider, was supposed to depict the scum meeting that Ali was going to at the end of Cult, where Ali would be met by other powerful women of AHS's past, including many characters played by Sarah Paulson, including Lana Winters, Cordelia Good, Bette Tadler, Dot Tadler, and an unspecified character played by Lily Rabe. Crazy, right? To be 100% real with you, I don't think there's any truth to this rumor. However, this is a rumor that has survived for seven years after the airing of Cult, and many fans believed it then, and they still believe it now. So let's get into some of the other information that this account spilled to try and determine its validity. Chronologically speaking, a lot of AHS7 Insider's early tea spills were pretty shoddy, mostly only revealing information that was already made available thanks to set photos or social media. Also during this time, they had some clues that turned out to be blatantly false. While teasing the initials of some of the cast members that would appear in Cult, mostly ones that had already been announced, the initials that hadn't been announced yet, though, seem to be teasing celebrities like Jamie Lee Curtis, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Cher, which all seem like fair guesses considering how each of those actresses have close relationships to people working on the show, Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, Chaz Bono, but of course it doesn't appear that any of these women were ever actually intended to appear in cult. 
The account also spread a fake premiere date for the season, and then later they claimed that they knew the real air date all along and they were just spreading the fake one just so that fans would be surprised when the real air date came out, which doesn't make any sense to me if you're an insider account trying to prove your credibility. But as the episode started airing, AHS7 Insider appeared to be getting better tea, as they were able to tease specific things that would happen in each episode, whether they were super integral to the plot or not. That said, throughout the season, they also continuously got things wrong as well. And throughout the account's history, they've made several claims about their own relationship to the production of AHS. One of the account's earliest allusions to them working on the show is this tweet, which seems to hint that they may be a part of the marketing team. Later though, after alluding to maybe working for the network, FX, the account quickly backtracked, stating, I don't work for FX, I work with them. I am hired for during and post-production duties. Also, I will... <laughs> Also, I will no longer waste my time arguing over my validity. All I can say is wait until September 13th, which of course is not the actual air date for Colt. Immediately, you can start to see some inconsistencies. And later in 2018, the account would even claim that they've been working on AHS since the first season, which I'd have to assume if someone was working on a show that they clearly loved, as this account demonstrates they love the show. They've been working on it for seven years and now they decide to start leaking information and risking their entire job just for some attention online. It just doesn't make any sense. In another instance of false information, on August 5th, 2017, after news broke about Lena Dunham being in the season, AHS7 Insider decided to start blatantly lying about her role, claiming she's in one of the first three episodes where she dies so quickly that the show will be praised for it. This is something that they repeat twice. And it is, of course, not true in the slightest, as Lena Dunham does not appear until episode 7, and she takes about 35 minutes before she dies, and they are some very long minutes. The next day was a particularly rough one for AHS7 Insider, as on August 6, 2017, they posted an alleged photo of the script for Colt's premiere episode. Only, the script misspelled the episode's co-writer and series co-creator, Brad Falchuk's last name. This had people running all around AHS Twitter professing that AHS7 Insider was a fake, and all of this ruckus even stirred up a response from Brad Falchuk himself, stating that he believes that the script is fake and that, quote unquote, they probably know how to spell his name. Not really sure who they are since this is a script that Brad co-wrote, so I would assume he would put his own name on it. So you may be asking, how did this account that has spread so many falsehoods have any credibility left by the time they started spreading the rumor about the alternate ending? And it honestly beats me because it was all right there. There's just way too much fishy information on this account for me to even start to believe any of it is real. Thanks to Brad Falchuk's vague wording and the fact that Brad didn't have access to the insider's private account, AHS7 Insider maintained that the script error was just a common typo that happens all the time on, on the AHS production, and they also got much more careful after that, usually only posting really inconsequential clues. In terms of how the account did get some things right, I think it's worth noting that, especially back then, you could honestly do a lot of sleuthing on film productions and TV productions like AHS and get a good amount of information back by just doing things like following crew members on social media, checking tags and locations on social media, keeping up with casting calls. These are all common practices practices that update accounts used back in the day, and hey, if you maybe happen to live in Los Angeles, you could easily follow these clues and try to follow the production around to many of their on-location shoots, and you could definitely get a good amount of information from that, as a lot of big scenes in Cult actually happen during on-location shoots that there are a lot of fan videos of if you look for them. My headcanon on who the identity of this insider changes all the time. Back in the day, I definitely thought they were legitimate, or at least they were getting their information from someone legitimate. But looking at it all now, with hindsight, I think that signs are pointing that they may have just been an online sleuth, or even, like I said, someone who did live in LA and was able to catch glimpses of the on-location shoots. They could have been a fan that was following the production through location to location, that also happened to have connections to people who worked on the show, get clues from them through conversations. But there are two clues on their account that I think point to this theory possibly being true, that they were just a fan that lived in LA. This spree of tweets, which clearly just consists of chants shouted by protesters in this scene, which was filmed in public with many onlookers. And then there is the rumor of Skylar Samuels being in the season. One of the account's most impactful tea spills consisted of them confirming that Skylar Samuels of Freak Show and Scream Queens would be in AHS Cult. When this obviously did not come to fruition, 
The AHS7 insiders said that the scene was filmed and just cut, and they claimed to even have photographic evidence that Skylar Samuels was on set for a scene that ended up being cut. They then posted their evidence, claiming that this person with the pink shirt and the red hair is Skylar Samuels. But the photo is distant enough to suspend your disbelief, sure. And another thing that this photo has going for it is that it is clearly from a scene that was scrapped, as the location is dressed up to read Brookfield Heights Eye Care, which is a location that we never saw in the season. So whether you want to believe this is Skylar Samuels or not, that's up to you. To me, it doesn't look like her. If you ever see Skylar Samuels, or if you are Skylar Samuels, comment below and confirm or deny this. I reverse image searched the image because I wasn't sure if uh, the insider was claiming to have originated the photo or not, or if they found it from a paparazzi site or something. But as far as I can tell, the insider is the originator of the photo. So for one, the redhead doesn't look like Skylar to me. And two, if you are AHS7 insider, who is someone who worked on AHS since season one, why are you taking photographic evidence of an actress being on set with a telephoto lens from like a block away? Do you work on the show or are you spying on the production? To me, this whole thing does not seem like something that a member of the AHS crew would be doing. Now, who knows, maybe the insider didn't take this photo and it was sent to them or something. But at the end of the day, I think all of which I have just laid out for you illustrates that this account is far from legitimate. In the account's tweet expressing their disappointment over all of the things that were cut from the finale, they also mentioned that in Ali's final cigarette smoking scene, there was supposed to be a nod to AHS Hotel. Now, they tweeted this shortly after Sarah Paulson herself confirmed that this scene did happen in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, where she said that she and the props people debated on if they should use a Hotel Cortez matchbox for the shot, and on a whim, they decided to shoot it, but ultimately the shot of her lighting the cigarette was cut from the episode. Many people, though, took this Sarah interview as confirmation that AHS7 Insider was legit since the tweet came out so close to the publication of the interview, which was around like midnight after the cult finale aired. So there's a chance that a lot of people that saw it, saw it the next day and maybe didn't check the timestamps. So many people took the Entertainment Weekly interview as Sarah Paulson confirming that everything w that was said in that tweet was true, when in reality, the insider was including something that Sarah had just confirmed to be cut from the finale to add credibility to the two things that the account made up. Again, I am of the belief that this account is a faker, but if you don't want to believe that, go ahead and believe whatever you want to believe. But at the end of the day, the account's lies were always much more exciting than the things they got right. This account would rebrand itself for seasons 8, 9, and 10, with varying amounts of information before seemingly disappearing from their account after that. It also just so happens that they stopped posting information when the AHS team moved away from Los Angeles, but again, that could be a coincidence. These rumors are definitely a lot of fun to think about, so go ahead and believe whatever you want to believe, but at least I finally feel somewhat resolved on these rumors, and to me, I feel comfortable putting them to rest. American Horror Story cult's style and broad ideas are both great and brand new to the series, and with seasons like 1984 and Delicate later treading similar ground at times, cult remains one of a kind. And a lot of the season's uniqueness is thanks to how it captured lightning in a bottle by being so reactionary to the then-recent 2016 election. The election is what the season is framed around, and while the season takes many different side quests through many convoluted timelines and side plots, by the end of the season it does circle back to the theme of the patriarchy and in response to it, female rage. Of course, as we just saw, this ultimately ends up with the season's allegory for Donald Trump, Kai Anderson, being shot in the head. Looking at what this scene is trying to say, it's both bold and radical, but the show goes out of its way in letting you know this. And by the end of the finale, it is of course revealed that Ali is operating under a modern iteration of scum, the cult that Valerie Solanas started all the way back in the 60s, which of course B.B. Babbitt would resurrect by using Kai as her mouthpiece, so essentially it's the same cult that was targeting her throughout most of the season that she is now a member of, or at least an evolution of it, as it itself was an evolution of scum. While the themes of patriarchy and female rage are definitely prominent in the tail end of the season, to me a more broad and overarching theme for the season is the act of radicalization, and the various ways that someone can abandon 
abandon who they once were at the influence of another. Ivy and Beverly selfishly abandon their political ideologies to take out revenge on people who have wronged them and for their own personal gain. Winter was so blinded by her loyalty to her brother that she didn't bat an eye when he started to take away her own rights. Harrison, Meadow, and Detective Colton Haynes all easily succumbed to Kai's influence thanks to all of their own individual intimacy issues. And then there's Kai, who was once just your average coder in his parents' basement until he witnessed some of the darkest shit the world has to offer with his parents' murder-suicide and what he saw at the Judgment House. These two events sent Kai down a dark spiral that truly was only hurting himself until he met B.B. Babbitt. B.B., of course, then manipulated Kai into channeling all of that negative energy towards building a new world as he saw fit. And of course, the season poignantly ends with Ali becoming exactly what Kai was trying to be, an all-powerful senator and cult leader. Now, do I love that B.B. Babbitt, a character that is introduced seven episodes in, was ultimately revealed to be the true big baddie of the season? No, absolutely not. With her extremely limited screen time and late introduction, it's hard for B.B. to not feel like a last-minute addition to the season in an attempt to try and link several loose themes and plot threads together. But thanks to Frances Conroy's magazine, magnetic performance as BB, the character still has a big impact. I just think she could have been even more impactful had they made her a stronger presence throughout the entire season and maybe didn't connect her to the story of Valerie Solanus. Another issue that I have with the season is that it feels incredibly disjointed. The first three episodes of the season are pretty straightforwardly paced, with that familiar cycle of Ali seeing a clown, and then no one believing her, and so on. But after that, the season begins to jump all over the place with its timeline, all while introducing a ton of new plot points, characters, and expansive flashback sequences. And what once seemed like a character study of Ali Mayfair Richards, turned into a crime drama about the descent towards Kai from his own clowns amid his rise in power. And frankly, as the season goes on, it feels like Ali is less and less important, of course, until the finale. And that is largely due to the writer's choice to have Ali's three-week vacation to the psych ward where the FBI does intervene and make her agree to be a double agent all of that is completely off screen and we don't know about it until the finale. So in all the screen time that Ali does get from episodes 7 to 10, she's just magically cured herself of all of her fears and is suddenly acting like an active protagonist. We just never got to see any of that development happen. And while all of Ali's development happens off screen, Kai, on the other hand, doesn't really develop at all. Kai starts the season as a sociopath who is hell-bent on seizing power by all means necessary, and while we do learn that once upon a time he wasn't like that, he ends the season with the very same intentions. And even though we are shown his backstory, even then his development happens off screen and we are just told about it through Winter's narration. And while characters like Winter or Beverly have enough screen time on paper to warrant some significant character arcs, both of their ending points in the season are not too far off from where they started. And all in all, it just felt like character development was not a priority in this season. That being said, in my head, I can see a successful version of this season where it does absolutely hit all of its themes out of the park, because on paper, this season has everything it takes to be one of the best seasons. But much like a lot of AHS seasons, the actual execution is just inconsistent. But in terms of set design, costumes, special effects, makeup, performances, and the season's marketing campaign, AHS Cult will always be one of my personal favorite seasons, even if it is not one of the most well executed. I'd also say that this is the season I would most want a follow-up to, whether it be another crossover season or just a full sequel, because it does have such an open ending that raises a lot of questions that I think could be explored further and really drive home the intentions of what Cult was trying to do in the first place. Alright, I hope you guys enjoyed this very deep dive into American Horror Story Cult. I had a lot of fun making it, as you can probably tell, as it is my longest upload to date by far. That being said, I would love to give another AHS season this kind of treatment, so if that's something you're interested in, definitely let me know in the comments below. And I've already got a similar video on the horizon with my part two to my Scream Queens video, in which I am going much, much, much more in depth into the first season of Scream Queens, much like how I just did with Colt. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that and all the other uploads I have coming up. If you guys could give this video a like and comment some of your thoughts on this season, it would really help 
boost this video's engagement and really help my chances out there in the wild wild west that is the algorithm. Thank you so much again to Kane and EJ for their contributions to this video. Thanks to AHS7 Insider for all the memories and a very special thanks to all of my YouTube members and my patrons who got to see this video early and with that I will see you guys next time.